and I hope you guys are awake enough because we are about to go into the mind-numbing details of controller area network. And uh, I'm a little sheepish on this, uh, mostly because I'm rather passionate on this topic. This is a very important part of the solution in the system that we use in the Wake Speed product. It's one of our other key differentiators. Um, we sit on committees that define these standards. Um, you'll learn more about different standards, RVC. Um, I was actually the person who was in charge of the revision of the DC subsystem section of the RVC standard. So this is an area that we have a very firm understanding on. This is an area that provides a ton of value. And this is also an area, when it works, you want to treat it like Apple. So you know, I've always kind of impressed with Apple products that they do marvelous things. And they're fairly easy to use. I, a lot of people think they are. Some people have different opinions. They're fairly easy to use. You have no idea all the details that went on behind it. There is a ton of stuff that's going on behind it. I don't need to know all those details. I just know it's kind of easy to use. Control area network's the same. Um, the reason why I think I was asked to go into this as a deeper dive is because it is very prevalent, especially in the marine space. Not just with these high energy DC subsystems, uh, especially talking between displays and batteries and everything, but NEMA 2000, which I understand you guys haven't covered yet, but it is a very common communication method between things like GPS's and chart plotters and radars and radios and uh, AIS. I mean, all this stuff. If you've got a blob that has the opportunity to communicate with another blob, that's what CAN does. Okay. So, uh, CAN, in a sentence, digital communication method for the automotive industry to allow to transfer of information between two nodes. Can you feel the propeller starting to turn with that sentence? So that's exactly what I said. You got a blob here and a blob here. This is a way to communicate. It was developed by Bosch in the 80s. Uh, and really, what the reason for it was, is if you think about, I always use the Cadillacs. So the Cadillacs have all sorts of marvelous features. And if you go to a Cadillac from the 60s or even the 70s, and you look on the door, and it's got all these buttons and switches. I mean, you know, you can change the temperature in the trunk from a switch on the door on the Cadillac, right? But when you open that door, you're going to see a wiring harness about this big around. Because every one of those switches has a wire that goes from that switch to the thing that changes the temperature in the trunk. It's just amazing delivery of, 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 of value, but my lord, this big giant wire. What CAN does is allow you to send a message rather through a wire, but through a shared communication bus. So instead of having 10 switches with 10 wires, you've got 10 switches to talk to one CAN bus. And when the switch to change the temperature in the trunk wants to change that, when you push that up, that switch will send out a message over the CAN bus to the thing in the trunk that manages the temperature and they'll say, oh, somebody wants me to raise the temperature here. That's how that basically works. Whereas before you had a physical wire that went point to point, now you've got a shared bus. So that wiring harness in the Cadillac door went from this to two wires. You only need CAN high and CAN low. That's the value of CAN. There's a tremendous, there are a lot of other really good values that CAN does. It was developed by Bosch for the automobile industry. And the reason that we standardize on it, and this is where we're getting in the real nerdy details, it has built into the protocol things such as prioritization, things such as deterministic delivery. If I send a message, I know it will get there. And I know it will get there in time. And I also know if I send a message that has a higher priority, than somebody else. For example, in the RV industry, they use the CAN bus to, to connect that switch that moves the sliders in and out. That switch doesn't have a wire going down to it. It sends a CAN message, move the slider in, move the slider out. That switch has a higher priority than the CAN messages that go to the person who says, I want the coach to be warmer or colder. And the reason they do that is because that switch is human safety. So 
that prioritization that's built into the CAN protocol, it's a fundamental aspect of it. If, if one person's over there adjusting the thermostat and someone's trying to stop the slider because Junior's about to get mowed down, that prioritization will assure that the temperature is going to stay the same and that slider is going to stop. Trust me, I could go on and on and on more, but it is a technology that was developed to solve problems. It is a technology that is very well thought out. It is incredibly per pervasive. If you go into your car, it's all there. There are multiple CAN segments. I think a typical car today has anywhere from two to 400 things that are talking to each other. All on CAN bus, actually usually on multiple CAN buses. So there you go. I've kind of done my, uh, my, my big speech about the value of CAN bus and we'll move on. I'm going to give you now two words that's going to make you a CAN expert. You will be heads and tails above everyone else. And those two words are backbone and drops. Every CAN subsystem, every CAN network consists of a backbone and drops. There are different wiring systems. And we talked about these the other day. This is a wiring system based on RJ45s. This is a wiring system based on DTM, common in automobiles. This is where to go. This is a wiring system based on M12s. The connectors and the wires are all different, but they all share backbone and drop. So what does that mean? What it means that we have all these things that want to communicate to each other. Just think of them all lined up around here on the table. The CAN backbone, the CAN network, is a connection at the top, and then there's a T that comes off of it to each of the nodes. So every node that wants to talk has a drop. There's the backbone and the drops. And it doesn't matter, the easiest way to see this is in the N2K, because it is literally a backbone and they put t plastic T's in it that has a little connector on it that you can screw this into the bottom of it. And I'm sorry I don't have an example here. Uh, maybe we'll get one and we can show, we can show one. There might be one somewhere on here. Great example on the, uh, on the panel. Right? All right, perfect, yeah, you can go see them there. So yeah, it is the backbone and the drops. So those two words, and the reason I'm belaboring this is because the wiring system, the way you physically wire the backbone and the drops is rather irrelevant. There's some certain details, there's impedance, twisted pair, all that kind of stuff. But by and large, they all are not relevant because they all are formed in backbones and drops. Even the RJ45 system, this little guy. The backbone, if I have a Victron guy over here, yep, blue for Victron, and the black one here that goes into wake speed, and then I carry on from this regulator to maybe another one, this becomes the backbone. I'll hold it this way, right? This becomes the backbone. The drop is inside the box. The backbone actually goes inside the box in this connector and comes out. And the drop is actually about three eighths of an inch between that and the little chip. It's still a backbone and a drop. If you can keep that concept in your head, that will help clarify a ton of issues that we, that we get when people get confused about what CAN is. I'm going to stop and breathe now. Does this help? Does this make sense? Yes. Perfect. I love that. The, uh, oh yes. Yeah. You mentioned that in some instances you're using multiple CAN bus systems. Yes. What is the advantage of having a setup that is used, I mean, why have two if you could have one? Correct. Why can't you have one? Yeah. I'll give you a perfect example. In the car, they'll have one CAN subsystem that's all the emissions and the ECU and the engine computer talking with all that stuff they'll have a totally separate CAN subsystem for the radio. And they do that for two reasons. There's so much traffic going on. And remember I told you about this deterministic stuff? It's really important that the engine, when he sends something out, he doesn't, he doesn't even want to have to deal with the fact that somebody's changing radio stations. Doesn't even want to consider it. And um, there's reason for that because the utilizations are so high in these type of environments. They're very closed that when you have this kind of prioritization thing, it can, 
you know, you, it's why you segment it. So there's a perfect example. Now, coming back to your world, to our world, it's very uncommon to have segmented cans. There are a couple of products out there that do can bridges. I think Digital Research, I think Marathon makes one. There might be a couple more. And what they'll do is they'll let you have one can network and a separate can network, and then you can put this bridge that has basically two drop points, so it lives in both network subsystems, and you can configure that thing to say, only pass messages from here to here, you know, these, don't send them all. There are, I've never seen those really used. There are some people who have installed them because they feel uncomfortable, they have a very rich, a very complex system. Uh, we will get into, uh, excuse me, one specific issue when we talk about CAN protocols, so make sure to remind me about bridges and why they might be used when we talk about the CAN protocols. Okay? Yes, sir? Could you just uh, give us a, a short list of what has emerged in the marine environment of the kinds of devices you can put on the CAN net? Uh, almost everything. Yo, there's kind of a statement that says everything's better with Bluetooth, right? These days, almost everything, I think, comes with CAN, with NEMA 2000-based CAN. It's very pervasive. Radios, AISs, you know, chart plotters, it's, it's very, very pervasive. And even many modern uh, engines. Oh, yeah. NEMA 2000 compatibility, which means they'll come free with all their senders pre-installed, mm -hmm. your oil pressure, your coolant temperature, all, the, all the, the information you need to know that you would normally historically see on an analog a suite of instruments can all show up in like on a flat screen as Yeah, analog. exactly. They appear as analog instruments yeah. or We'll talk about that as some examples and stuff, but yeah, uh, CAN and NEMA is very, very pervasive. Um, pretty much everything. Did you have? I saw your hand go up quick. Is a backbone cable wired the same as a drop cable, and it's just how you hook them up into the system to make the network? So a backbone is, if you will, the freeway. And I don't like this graphic, but I had a graphic in that our marketing department complained about. So we're going to find a better one. <laughs> um, uh, the uh, the backbone is literally just think of it this way. Here's the backbone and then drops. And on the end of each drop is a device. Now, some CAN specs let you have multiple devices on drop, but we're not going to go into that subtlety. Just think of a backbone, a T, and drop to a device. Yeah, I understand that. Okay. If I go into my bag, yeah. do I have, and I'm setting up this network, do I have to be careful whether I pick up a backbone cable? Oh, I understand your question. So this is a detail of NEMA 2000. They make a difference, uh, they, they define a backbone cable and a drop cable. We're probably not going to get to that subtlety. Um, there are limits to how many devices you can add to a backbone. And that is sometimes depending in the case of NEMA 2000 about whether you use the thick cable or the thin. That is a level of detail and subtlety we're not going to have time to get into at this point. It is an area of study that probably takes a couple hours to kind of work through those permutations. Is that the question you're asking? Is there a physical difference between the two cables? Yeah, there is actually. The, the cables themselves will have, uh, in the NEMA 2000 world, the physical difference between the two is the, uh, mostly about the power carrier. Because in NEMA 2000, they run four wires, they run two for a twisted pair for the CAN network itself, the CAN high, CAN low, and then they also run power wires. So I think the physical difference between those two cables is mostly the power wires are bigger, um, but I don't recall, there may also be some additional shielding or something around the twisted pair. I don't recall that subtlety. Um, but if I happen to pick up a drop cable and connect it as a branch, yeah. it will work? It'll work, okay. yeah. but. Uh, I'm putting a little asterisk there. Um, can, can, can hardware, the thing that actually does the hardware communication, is incredibly robust and incredibly reliable, and you can put a lot of crap into it and it'll still work. Just because it works now 
doesn't mean it's going to work tomorrow if you're on the edge. So this is where for each of the specs, RVC, J1939, NEMA 2000, there is a definition section that's anywhere from one page to many pages long that says this is how you can wire our system up, how big your backbone can be, how many drops you can have, what's the total distance, what's the total length. This all goes into signal theory and reflections and a lot of smart people have figured this out. So the real answer is, will it work? Yeah, it's probably going to work. But is it what you should do? No, you should look at the spec, see what it says, and, and engineer your system to the spec. Okay? All right. Um, the, so um, carrying on, I think that's it for this. I mean, we've got the physical wiring, which is a very important and, to be honest, the most trip up point that we have found when people trying to uh, install the wake speed regulator. They just get confused by all these options. So if you can remember that all of them deliver back one and drops, you can actually mix these different wiring standards. But I'm just going to suggest pick one. Either do everything as NEMA 2000, do everything as RJ45, and move on with life. Uh, even though you can mix them, I'm going to suggest you don't. The other detail about this is at the end of the backbone, there is a terminator on each end, 120 ohms on each end. This is again, propellers turning hard now. This is a hardware signal transmission bus. And the energy has to be terminated or it'll be reflected and you'll get what's called nulls. If you don't absorb the energy when it gets to the end with the terminator, it will be reflected because of the impedance mismatch and it'll be inverted 180 degrees and you will get, it'll have to be a fairly long one, but you can actually, one can do the math. You will find some point if you attached a device right here, there'll be no signal. Because the original signal is coming out one way, the, R sig the reflected signal is coming out reflected, and they cancel each other out. So you get 10 minus 10, you get zero. You get, the, it's called nulls. So the termination is probably the second biggest issue that we have run across in CAN subsystems. They don't terminate it, or more commonly, they over-terminate it. And we're going to talk a little bit later about how you can do uh, testing for this. Uh, I'll just give you a quick hint. If your CAN subsystem is unpowered and you apply an ohm meter, that's 120 ohms, that's 120 ohms. Those two in parallel, you should see 60. If you don't see 60, if you see above it, you're, you're under-terminated. The system will probably work, not reliably. If you see 45 ohms or less, it's over-terminated. We have had a few support calls, and I, I'll pass this on because you're going to be dealing with customers. Well, when you do it, you won't deal with customers like this, but you'll have people bringing stuff in that says, I installed this, it doesn't work, can you fix it? I remember this one customer, we went round and round and round, and he wouldn't take the ohm meters. And finally, I talked him into doing it. And he said, huh, I've got 28 ohms. It's like, you have five terminators in your system. No, I don't, there's one here, there's one. Here. He went and found them, he found all, he finally got the 45 ohms. There was one more terminator. And the guy was arguing with me about this. Like, no, they're all, it's like, dude, this is a physics thing. I, I can tell you about the parallel resistors and why you got 45 ohms. He found the terminator it was in, the, in the base of the signal mask. The person, whoever did the install, they didn't have a backbone long enough to go up to the top of the mast where a terminator lived. In the base, they put a T in, and for some reason, they hid a terminator there. This guy, it took him like an hour and a half to dig that thing out. And I see the guys in the background going, oh yeah, we all have those stories. So that is, when we have issues with the can, that's probably one of the biggest issues of unreliability is improper termination. And I don't care if it's a wake speed or a NEMA 2000, it doesn't matter. That's probably the single biggest issue. All right, uh, I'm not going to ask questions because I know that uh, this is a lot of information to absorb. Yes, sir. I just want to uh, <laughs> let them know that almost every box, when you unpack it, there's a resistor in, or there's a terminator in there. Mm -hmm. So people think, well, it comes in a box. It's in the box, so I used it. Yeah, I don't want spare parts. And you know what's absolutely the worst? There are some devices out there that build a terminator into the device. 
That is a total violation of all these specs, but they do it. So, and there's actually the REC BMS, the cable that they provide has a terminator built into it. So when we talk about different battery systems that we use, in that case, you either put the REC at the end, right? because it already has a terminator in it, or you have to figure, go and open the thing up and cut the terminator out. Another hint, um, since we're on this, is uh, some of the lithium systems and the lithium cables. They'll have terminating resistors built into their wiring harness. They will, you know, this, uh, this is black connectors, the type they use. You will find if you open the cover up, they'll actually have a 120 ohm resistor inside there. You have to read their specs very carefully and if you got a question, throw an ohm meter on. This thing should be open. If it shows 120, you got to find that resistor or use it, find that resistor and take it out or know that resistor is there and design it into your system when you design the system. Okay. All right. Hang on now. Colorful picture. CAN subsystem, the hardware consists of three wires, CAN high and CAN low. CAN high in this case is yellow, CAN low is green. This is the automobile standard. Here's where you can take some notes. In the automobile, this is the industry standard. CAN high is high, it's yellow like the sun. CAN low is low, it's low like the grass green and yellow. Remember I said yesterday, please don't hook this yellow wire up to your stator. This is the one you want to hook to the stator. Yeah, we've had people do that and wonder why it didn't work. Uh, so that's two of the wires. In the marine world, the NEMA 2000 uses blue and white. Can high is white like the clouds. Can low is blue like the water. You will never need to know this, but if you really want to whip that out sometime at a party and impress your friends, that's something you could do. So we have what's known as a differential pair. We already showed this on the backbone, right? Uh, we showed this in this diagram that there were two wires, a differential pair it's called. That's the signal theory. Now this is what actually goes across that differential pair. Can high, when you want to uh, send a zero, it's kind of weird. When you send a zero, you bring can high high and you bring can low low. So normally this is about a three and a half volt spread. So normally when there's a recessive state, you'll see it where the two signals are very close, if not exactly the same voltage, and it will usually sit around about um, two volts, two and a half volts. They'll both be the same. Then when you want to send a different something other than a zero or a one, when you want to send something different, those signals go apart. It's called differential pair. The reason this is done is for noise immunity. And I told you this is going to be a nerdy talk. The reason this is done is for noise immunity. If there's some radio outside interjecting noise, bang, or a stator wire or a field wire interjecting noise into this can pair, you'll have that noise travel through the air and intercept this pair. Ideally, theoretically, when it introduces noise into the wires, it'll introduce the same noise into both. So if we only had a uh, one wire and we, and we introduce noise, and let's say that noise brought this signal all the way down, it was strong enough to do that. Well, we would confuse this. We would think, oh wow, that changed. But because we have a differential pair, what it's going to do is going to bring both of those down. And when we receive it, we don't care what the absolute value is. If we had just one wire, we want to know if it's high or low. But if we have two wires, we only care if they're the same voltage or apart. And that's why this is higher noise immunity. It's also one of the reasons why I use twisted pair that also helps with noise immunity. Yes, ma'am. When you were describing the voltage of the two Mm -hmm. uh, communication was a zero and the one. Did mm -hmm. you say that when it was communicating the one, which is the voltage that is close together, it was sitting at 2.5 volts? Roughly, roughly. It's a passive state 
what's actually happening, what actually happens is the CAN transceiver, and this is another reason why we use it. There are like a bagillion of these things made. And probably one of the smartest chips inside this entire product is this little guy here called the CAN transceiver. They cost like 20 cents. And it's the one that does all that sending and receiving. So when it is in its uh, passive state, it's not doing anything. So that's where the resistors on each end pull those two wires together. That's no reason you have to have the resistors. Then if somebody along that network wants to send a signal out, they will drive this one toward five volts and that one toward ground. Does that answer your question? Um, and so on your diagram, is the small gap in between the one high and the one low, is that representative of 2.5 volts or are you, like, where are you measuring that? Yeah, that's actually the third wire. That's a great question. The third wire involved in this is the reference. And the ground wire is the third wire. So in the case of the NEMA 2000, remember I told you, that's a great question. Uh, in case of the NEMA 2000, I mentioned there's a red and a black, a power wire that goes with it. That black wire is the reference ground wire. In the case of, it's called an isolated, isolated CAN network. In the case of almost every other CAN network in the world, they don't do isolation and the ground reference becomes some ground reference. So like in the RV world, the reference point for ground is battery negative. Okay, so if you wanna measure a voltage, and I guess that's where you're going to, you would put your negative, your black probe on the battery ground and you'd put your red probe on either can high or can low. Okay, yes sir. The difference between NEMA 183 and 2000 in terms of the voltage differences and why 183 is preferred in commercial applications because yeah, I'll leave it at that. You know what? I'm going to be a little weak on this because I got to tell you. So 183 uh, controller area network can, which is what we're fixating on here. The hardware and what we're looking at here is a differential pair and how it communicates. NEMA 183 is based on another standard that's called RS-485. It's also a differential pair. Uh, you, in addition to 183, if you ever deal with solar controllers or even with Victron, the Victron VE bus network is an RS-485 signal. It's, sometimes, it's a lot of times called Modbus. Modbus is the protocol that is very prolific in those type of deployments, and we'll talk about protocols next. But it uses 485 as the underlying carrier. And the difference is, and this is why 485 is more robust, is whereas we use a five volt swing, I believe 485 uses 12 volts, right? Yeah. I think it's, you know, there's a spec range that you're allowed, but it's definitely bigger. So you have more difference between them, so you can get more noise immunity, so. That. But 480, um, the, the Modbus stuff, you know, obviously you're going to run across it a lot with the Victron equipment because it's very pervasive. Um, and then also if you have the 183. But that, the, we had the question the other day, why 183 and NEMA 2000 are incompatible. One of the reasons is that this is like the little five volt swing and there one's the big 12 volt swing. There's other reasons as well, but that's one, definitely one of them. Okay. Um, so I want to come back to kind of pester on this a little bit. I talked about nominal voltages that you'll likely see. The reason why, nobody's driving this to two and a half volts. The reason this ends up around two and a half volts is at this point somebody drove it to like high and low and then when people just let the car coast, that's what's happening here, it kind of settles down to somewhere in between. And it has to do with residual capacitance in, inside the whole transmission line. So you cannot go up to an inactive CAN network and put a meter on there and say, I don't get two and a half volts. That's not going to happen because no one's driving it to two and a half volts. That two and a half volts is an artifact of an active bus. The only way you're going to actually see this stuff is with an oscilloscope. Voltmeters, you can do some stuff, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but by and large, if you're to the point where stuff isn't working and you gotta get to this level, an oscilloscope's the only way you can see it. And I have no idea, is that the level that you guys are getting into at some point? I'm gonna show them on an 
Let's go, but we're not going to dive into it. We do have a couple adapters that we can put into the system, put into a computer, and then go back. Just to show it, yeah. Um, I will tell you, myself as an engineer, I love to bring my toys out. If any of you folks are in the field and you're feeling like you have to do it, you're way down a rabbit hole you don't need to be. You need to step back and remember the two magic words, backbone and drop. Verify your terminators. <laughs> That's going to cover 99% of any issues you will ever find with the CAN subsystem. So the other thing I wanted to show on here, and this is the most detailed slide we're going to do about CAN bus, and then we're going to, you know, come out of this ditch. There are defined in the controller area network two types of packets, and they're called standard addressing and extended addressing. And you look at this, this is actually what a CAN frame looks like. I've talked quite a bit about a packet gets sent. That's the packet. So when somebody wants to send battery voltage from the BMS to the wake speed regulator, it sends something that looks like this, a packet. It says, here's the packet, has battery voltage in it. In the front of the packet, there's some startup, start a frame, and this is so that little 29 cent chip can go, ooh, something's about to arrive, I should pay attention. Then there is the address. They call it arbitration here, but this is the address. And you'll notice that in this case, uh, let's see, which one am I on? Or did I copy two of the same? Well, I hope I didn't. Arbitration fuel control data. Oh, shoot, I gotta change this because I think I have two of the same. Um, this is the standard packet, it's only 11 bits. You can only have an address that's 2 to the 11, which is 2048. So when a packet comes across, the protocol defines how this is going to be interpreted. What does this mean? So when a node receives one of these packets, they'll know, hey, this is something that I care about, or they'll say, I don't really care. So when the GPS receives the battery voltage, it's going to look at this part of the message, because that tells what the packet contains, and decide where it wants to pay attention to it or not. GPS is going to say, Psh, I don't care about battery voltage. The wake speed is going to receive a position, lat and long. It's going to say, I don't care about it, and ignore it. But when it receives a packet it cares about, then it will then carry on, and they'll look at the data. And uh, yeah, I actually did mess this up. What happens is, in the extended frame, is they have this front part here with, 20, with 11 bits, and then they sneak in more bits to get 29 bits of information, not just 11. That will become relevant here in just a minute. So you got the first part of the field that says, this is what this packet contains. And then the last part of the field is, here's the actual data. And you can only send a fairly small amount of data. It's amazing how big this thing is between the address and the arbitration and the uh, consistency checks to send a little bit of information, it's just amazing how much extra junk is packed onto this. But that's what partly makes these things reliable. In the data field is where I'll see the voltage or the current or the ladder long. And this, again, is defined by the protocol. If we're talking about the CAN system itself, the 2.0A, the 2.0B, as defined by Bosch, that this little 29 cent chip iron stands, he doesn't care what these bits are high or low. He just says, oh, look, I got 0001000. I'll pass it on to somebody and see if they want to care about it. So, yes, sir? So, isn't this arbitration field is sort of how they prioritize the messages? Yeah, yeah. What actually happens is, at a very, very technical level, remember how I told you that uh, the slider trumps the thermostat? The, the slider is going to want to send a much more of these active signals. So if at some point in time, the thermostat's trying to send a 0, 0, 1, 0, and the, and the slider's saying 0, 0, 0, the thermostat's trying to make that signal go low. Well, guess what? It can't, because it's not actively driving it low. The low is because no one's driving it. That's how that technically works at the hardware level. Because the slider is making that high, only his message will get through and the thermostat won't. Well, my question was, uh, is there any situation where you as a tech would be uh, changing 
being the priority, or is that just sort of hardwired into? Generally, it's hardwired in. It's, it's, hard, it's hardwired in. Yes. We actually will talk about priorities, but it's unrelated to this. The protocols themselves will define the messages and, and who is more important. And the way the protocol does it is it assigns the guys they care about more, more zeros. Okay. Now, actually, and that's the difference. I'm really kind of annoyed. I've got to fix this. In the extended address, in this 11-bit one, which you will find, it will be called the BE CAN, it will be called the Victron BMS protocol. Third parties, you have third party batteries that can talk to Victron. They use this 11 bit protocol. If you look at wake speed, we have stuff we call SMA, and we'll talk about this later today. There's different protocols that are this 11 bit. You can't send as much, this is what it is. Uh, there's not the ability, there's just not enough room. You pretty much send, here's something, deal with it, right? Whereas with the extended one, you can send, here's something, and here's a priority. And here's, a, um, and here's who sent it and here's who I want to receive it. You've got more room to add more information with the extended protocols. That's how NEMA 2000 works. That's how RVC works. That's how BE regs work, if you ever get into that detail. Very specific example to answer your question. Within RVC, there is a message that comes out with the battery voltage. And in the spec, it says it's got a priority that's pretty much equal to everyone. It's, it's just like a thermostat, right? Uh, and, and, oh, you should also know that anybody who's sending a message, they're monitoring to see if it goes out. So if that thermostat's message didn't go out, he'll just try again. And he'll just keep trying until it finally goes out. So everyone's kind of an equal playing field except for that guy in the slider because it's more important. In the RVC spec, where the battery sends out battery voltage and the battery sends out battery current, if the battery decides that those values are over its limit, the spec allows you to raise the priority of that message. And the idea is that the battery was trying to tell the world, here's what I'm seeing, here's what I'm seeing, and somebody's playing with the thermostat, and that message doesn't go out timely. And when you go over the limits, and the battery wants to tell the world, hey, listen to me, I'm overstressed, stop doing it, or I'm going to start pulling the ripcord, it lets the battery raise that priority, get that message out absolutely, deterministically, and the thermostat can wait. That's a very specific example. Unless you're a guy like me, you're never really going to pay attention to that stuff. Okay? This is massively more detailed than you will ever, ever have to experience. Uh, unless you want to buy a Raspberry Pi and a can hat, and do sniffing, then you're going to be at this level. Yeah, I know. I saw you pointing to him, and I was looking at him as well. <laughs> By the way, you can remind you, you can do it with the wake speed, too. Really expensive can sniffer, but, you know, it does the job. Uh, the walk away I want you to have from all of this is there is a ton of history. There are millions and millions of dollars that have gone into developing this incredibly robust reliable, pervasive, and relatively cheap method for nodes to communicate with each other. Okay. The next thing we're going to talk about is protocols, how we would interpret this information. So just remember, every CAN packet's got a header that says what this is, and then it's got the actual data. Does anybody have questions at this point, or are you really ready for me to move on? Good, I'm gonna move quick before someone thinks I'm on. All right, so some of this we covered a little bit. Uh, we're gonna talk about the protocol now. Up to this point, we're talking about the hardware. We've been talking about the backbone and the drops, the terminators, differential pairs. We've been talking about all that stuff. Now we're gonna talk about, and also what the packets are, you know, what a packet looks like. Now we're gonna talk about how packets are interpreted. And this is something called the protocol. NEMA 2000 is a protocol. RVC is a protocol. Those two protocols are pervasive in the marine world, in the RV world. NEMA 2000 has messages defined for Latin long. RVC has messages defined for sliders. 
I will guarantee you RVC, actually my RVC doesn't care about Latin long. I will guarantee you that NEMA 2000 doesn't care about sliders and they certainly don't care about locking the front door. I'm trying to see if someone picked up that reference. <laughs> so uh, there are protocols that are defined for a reason and specific to the industry to satisfy those needs. There are many, many other protocols. Because CAN is such a beautiful, wonderful way for two nodes to talk with each other, there are those used in the industrial industry. You know, if you've got process control, a lathe, a smart lathe that you program and communicate, very likely has CAN inside of it. There are lots of protocols. I've listed a few of them here. Uh, CAN King, CIA, CAN Open. Uh, you know, this just goes on and on and on. The ones we care about, there's three of them. Maybe four, but three primarily ones. J1939 and then RBC and NEMA 2000. J1939 is, think of it as the first floor of the protocol. They split, you remember I said there's 29 bits? They take half of that and say, this is for J1939. J1939 is what's in your car. It's what lets the engine start and the windows go up and down. It's what does a lot of details about nodes identify who they are and they register themselves on networks so everyone understands who all is out there and what they can do. That's all done on the first floor. That's J1939. It's called data page zero if you care. J1939 says we're going to have this other upstairs that we're just going to let someone else move into. And they can do what they want. Called data page one. That's where RBC lives. That's where NEMA 2000 lives. So J1939 is important because whenever we write a NEMA 2000 stack, we have about 15 messages in J1939 that we have to process. It's mostly around registering yourself on the network, making sure you have a unique address, you don't get conflicts, stuff like that. And then all the rest of the messages, the Latin longs and radios and AIS is on the second floor in NEMA 2000. Same with RBC. We have a J939 portion of our stack for the housekeeping, and then the second floor is, here's a slider, here's a battery, here's all this stuff. This is where the question came in about bridges. J1939 is the parent here. They're the adult in the room, and they live on the first floor. And they say, don't come down and be messing in my kitchen on the first floor. You have the second floor, do what you want. So the guys up on the second floor, the NEMA 2000, the RVC, they're, they're kind of greedy and they want the whole floor for themselves. So there is a conflict there. And that's where a bridge can come in uh, a little bit. And I, I guess maybe I'm actually gonna talk a bit more about that um, in a little bit. So, but just keep that in mind. So for us, through all of this stuff that I've been rambling on now for quite a bit, and then we may actually uh, be close to uh, doing a break. Uh, if you want, we're getting close to that. Okay, I'll look for a break time. Through all of this, what I want you to remember is the hardware aspect, backbone and drops, the terminators. The protocol aspects, the ones we care about are the 29-bit ones, the J1939 and the foundation, and then RBC. And because you're moving in, I'm sorry, Neiman 2000 in the marine world, and because you're moving into the high energy space RBC. And just so you know, the reason why that was done, NEMA 2000 is wholly, it has nowhere near enough capability to allow BMSs and stuff to talk with each other. They just, it's not the right protocol, won't work. That's why we do RBC. Alrighty folks, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, we have just spent a mind numbingly very shallow dive into the world of CAN. And there's apparently some people are interested in it. So I don't know if the instructor ever wants to come back and have a deep, deep dive. I think we're doing a NEMA 2000 day. No, I mean a deep dive. O scopes, protocols, all that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this would definitely be extra credit. Anyway, um, with the exception of, say it with me, backbones, drops. And where are the things on the end? Terminators. With the exception of that, and that there are multiple protocols, you can forget everything I just covered all this morning. Because 
If you truly, that's really more for your education and information. If in the real world you get to the point where you're diving to that level, something has really gone sideways and you know, it's, it's, you're going down the path incorrectly. So what we're going to talk about now is what you do need. This is the practical applications. So things like, we talked about backbone terminators at each end, we talked about differential pair, the ground reference, okay? Um, probably, uh, and remember, a subtle detail. In the NEMA 2000 world, they use that black wire in the backbone cable and the drops, that's the ground reference. That's why in the NEMA 2000 network, you have a power tap. You have to supply power into that, gets its ground reference, and there's a reason for it. In all the rest of the world, they don't use isolated uh, CAN bus. RVC doesn't, cars don't, I mean, typically don't. They never use absolutes. But in general, your ground reference is going to be your battery. And even in NEMA 2000, your ground reference is going to be your battery, because usually when that power drop comes out, you hook the black to the, to the ground and the red to a 12 volt battery, all right? Then the other kind of things that we have to worry about, a detail, is the can and the baud rate. There is how fast is these, uh, this information being sent? The actual, how quickly does the ones and zeros change? On your Victron, uh, the VE can port, NEMA 2000, RVC, Default J1939, they all run at 250K. That is the one you're always going to run across. However, on the Victron, the, the BMS CAN port, this is where you go sometimes bring in third party batteries, you know, through the Lux protocol, you know, Chinese batteries, something like that. That typically runs at 500K. So when you're setting stuff up, you know, notice the wake speed has the ability, you can change these baud rates. You'll just want to make sure the baud rates are the same. That's a detail that you will have to make sure is correct, because if one guy's speaking faster than the other one, it just ain't going to work, okay? The other big issue that we have is the, the CAN wires, the CAN high and CAN low are not connected, and that is specifically, we run across that with the uh, crossover cable with Victron. I mentioned to you about sins of the past, that the, uh, the black end, wake speed, uses a industry published standard, CIA 303. The blue end does not, uses a Victron standard. And, and there's actually a reason for that. I kind of poke fun at Victron, but there is a reason. They, they have their own sins of the past where they ended up with this. But it means that, uh, and I forget which one it is, but one and two and seven and eight are, are the pin numbers on each end. And it's documented if you go to the learn tab, get the Victron, uh, uh, install guide. It'll show you exactly what to do. That's probably one of the bigger issues we have when people are installing RJ45s. Okay. Uh, I think that's it can for I, that. Can I make an, uh, sort of an interesting, uh, you may. Important point. Yeah. Um, data terminators are yes. also uh, different wire configurations, and you can do nasty things if you try to stick a Victron data terminator in a Yeah, especially on a 48 volt, because one of the things, uh, the subtle detail is, on, R, on these uh, RJ45s, the CIA spec allows power to be transmitted over this bus, so you can have displays and stuff that are self-powered just by the Cat5 cable. Uh, Turns out the Victron uses those two pins for their can high and can low. So when you plug one of these into a wake speed, you're applying battery power to it. Now, um, 48 volt environments, that gets really fun. Okay. Uh, okay. So we've actually talked about some of this stuff, but I'm going to kind of go over it in a systematic way. As you're sitting there and designing your system, the little hint that I always start with is start out with the battery and the BMS. What is the battery system? Are you doing uh, lithium? Are you doing a Victron Lynx? Are you doing a Dynas? Are you doing somebody that has an RG45 pinouts? Is it a industrial pinout? Is it a NEMA 2000 pinout? You know, decide from the BMS first what your backbone's gonna be. Assuming you have a BMS connected battery. If you don't, then continue to make your own decision. In the marine world, I think for me, it comes down fairly simply. If you're largely doing nothing but Victron, this is the easiest way to do it. 
If you're going to connect your Victron and your wake speed into a NEMA 2000 displays because you want to see that information, I'd suggest just do this. Go with a little adapter, get our CAN enabled cables, and that just makes a clean install. Don't try to be creative and do mixed networks. I mean, you can, but just, just don't. Just keep it simple. Okay? Oh, DTM, that's that automobile standard. I probably haven't said that yet. Any questions on this? I mean, if you were just plumped down, think of installs that you might be doing. Do you have kind of a clear picture of what the CAN wiring system would look like? How you might put it together? I'm only seeing one head nod. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> you have a couple of resources you can draw on. Perfect. Yes, sir. Can you just, uh, for our benefit, clarify? I got you. I got that you said DTM is the automotive standard. Yeah. When you're looking at all the variants of connectors that one might find, do they use voice connectors or what do they use? It depends on, yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, it depends on the, 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 the kind of the wiring standard. So DTM, that is this guy. This is Dorch Miniature. That's what that stands for. A Dorch, a DT connector is actually this guy. He's a little bit larger. You'll look at, if you want to come up and look at them, they look very much the same, but this one's smaller, right? You can come up and take a look here. Um, in terms of NEMA 2000, this is called an M12, M12-5A, I think. It's, uh, it's an M12 connector. I'm not sure exactly who is Device the... Device Net is, is kind of that. Device Net is the one who uses the standard. The M12 might, again, be a Dorch. I, I'm not sure who the original manufacturer is, but this is known as an M12 connector. And then these, I call RJ45. This socket is actually what is RJ45. That's where that name comes from. Okay. Does that answer your question? It does. I, okay. I, I should have known that DTM is going to be. Yeah. With the DT series and the next size up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you'll see these things. They are pervasive on engines and cars. They're just all over. Okay. All right. Uh, the protocol, the next thing you're going to have to worry about is the protocol. And the two most common ones you're going to run across is RVC and NEMA 2000. NEMA 2000 is pretty obvious in the marine world. Its use in this case is for display. So if you've got a Garmin display or you've got one of these big fancy glass panels and you want to see what the alternator temperature is, you can connect the wake speed up to your NEMA 2000 bus. You can configure that glass panel display to receive the information from the wake speed regulator, and there you'll see alternator temperature. That's primarily how you're going to interact with NEMA 2000. So when making that decision, your design decision, you want to ask your customer, what are you planning on doing? Do you want to see this wake speed information, do you want to see battery information on your NEMA 2000 display? If the answer is yes, I'd probably go toward this wiring standard. There are two hands up in the back. Yes, sir. Um, I can put the wake speed into the servo, and the servo can connect to the NEMA 2000 and display my... You could. Can I still get the wake speed stuff that way through the servo? You could. Now, this goes back to... Yes, you could, but I'm going to say don't. Because what you're doing is you're connecting the wake speed through this wiring standard to the servo, and then you're transitioning from the servo into the NEMA 2000. You're mixing the backbones. Yes, you can. I'm just going to suggest keep it simple. Put the wake speed up to your NEMA 2000 backbone this way. From Victron, get their little adapter cable, do the links up to the NEMA 2000, and just use the NEMA 2000 for the backbone. Okay? So, and that's the hardware question, right? It doesn't matter which back, what wiring system you use, as long as you've got the backbone. And the thing you're describing is, we start the backbone over here with, with device that NEMA 2000. We go into the servo when we transition to RJ45. We'll go to the wake speeds and we'll finish the backbone with RJ45. Yes, you can. I'm suggesting don't. Just 
make it all consistent, keep your life simple and move on. When you're getting paid, if you are fundamentally cheap and your cost for your time is zero, play those games. When you're doing an install for a customer and the customer is footing the bill, just make it simple. And don't just be thinking about you installing it. Think about the poor schmuck a year down the road that has to figure out what the heck was done. You don't want to be known as that prior installer or colorful adjectives associated with the prior installer word, right? Keep it simple. All right, so the protocols that we worry about, NEMA 2000, we talked about display only. Really, that's the value of NEMA 2000. It's going to let you present to the end user what's going on within their battery system and their alternator system. The other protocol we care about is RVC. RVC is the fundamental protocol that the wake speed is based on. It's because RVC has, uh, I think, 16 message types identified around the battery. The battery can tell the wake speed, what is my voltage? What is my current? What's my temperature? It can say, please charge me. Stop charging me. I'm gaining stress. Slow down. I only want this many volts. I only want this much current. By the way, I'm thinking about pulling the rip cord. You better stop. By the way, I'm pulling the rip cord. I hope you stopped. All of those messages exist in RVC. There's only one of those that exists in NEMA. So that's why we can't use NEMA for the fundamental process control. Okay? So I'll get to you in a minute. Um, so the RVC is the fundamental backbone. You cannot get away from it. You have to use RVC. Remember j 1939s on the first floor? RVC is going to occupy a part of that second floor. It has to be there if you're going to have the wake speed regulator talk to another wake speed regulator or the wake speed regulator talk to almost any battery subsystem. You can turn RVC off, part of the configuration, the advanced configuration. It will disable the ability of the wake speed to receive battery information. It'll disable the ability of the wake speed to talk to another regulator and do prioritization. All those values I said, it will disable that because it's all based on RVC. You have to have RVC. Those are the two protocols you're going to care about. If you want to, you can go to the 100-page document, and I'm looking at you. <laughs> you can go to the 100-page document. I think Appendix C, we document all the CAN messages we do. We do not give the details of the CAN messages. You can go to the respective standards. RVC publishes their standard on rvc.com. You can download it for free. NEMA 2000 publishes their standards. You can join NEMA. You can join and pay the yearly fee, and then you can buy the standard from them. So, but you can get that information. Okay. Question in the back? Well, it's just uh, wondering when you say it gets the information from the battery, you mean battery management? Yes. Not a regular battery. Right? Not a regular battery. Yeah. This is if you have a CAN enabled battery. All right? Okay. And there's other places that the wake speed can get information. It can get information from a smart shunt. It comes in actually over the CAN bus and it gets presented to the wake speed regulator. Uh, remember I told you there was one message in NEMA 2000 that was useful? Voltage, current, and temperature. We can get that from a smart shunt. So there is actually a way to install the wake speed if you've got like a Victron smart shunt with a servo that you don't eat with a traditional battery that you don't have to hook up the uh, purple and a uh, gray wire. You don't have to hook up the temperature sensor. You can actually have that come in over the NEMA 2000. You can make your choice. There's a lot between here and there. If you ever do studies on failure modes, you will understand one of the first principles is every single thing you add between here and there introduces a failure mode and decreases reliability. So your choice, you have to design the system. But that's an option that you can do. And uh, I'm looking for my clicker. There it is. All right. So the takeaway here is the two primary protocols we care about, RVC and NEMA 2000, are the two we care about. There are probably seven or eight different BMS protocols. And we'll cover this uh, when we do configuration. It's in the advanced tab where you can select an alternative configuration. So I've mentioned uh, SMA. I've mentioned LUX. These are protocols that are often used by uh, 
Chinese batteries, uh, not just Chinese batteries, it's also used by Victron, it's called, sometimes it's called the Victron BMS protocol. It's an 11-bit protocol. Um, it's a little bit less capable, but there are alternative protocols that the wake speed can, can be configured to support as well. So sometimes those will come into play, and that's why you always start with, start with your battery. Figure out what you're doing with your battery and then work from there, okay? Uh, next, we want to talk about uh, the brothers, NEMA 2000 and RVC. And this is probably the picture I'm most proud of that I found. I talked about the second floor, NEMA 2000 and RVC. These guys love each other and they absolutely hate each other. In every one of those specs, they say, doubt shall not ever transmit a message that's not in J1939 or me. So RVC says it is a violation to have a packet transmitted that's not the data page zero J1939 or the DP1 as defined by RVC. NEMA 2000 says the same thing. In the very purest sense, unless you disable one or the other of these, this will not pass a certification in those type of environments because of that. But the reality is that those two guys coexist. They have different bedrooms on that second floor. So mostly they're okay. They stay in their own room. Battery messages go out through NEMA this way. Battery message goes out through RV this way. And the world's happy. However, they do share a common bathroom. There is a small number of messages that overlap. And for those who want to take a technical detail, now is the time to pick up your pencil and get ready to write. The overlapping messages are the battery, some of the battery messages in RVC, it's called DC source status. Some of those use the same identifier. Remember I talked about the identifier says what this packet contains. Some of those use the same identifier as NEMA 2000 uses for what NEMA 1000 calls a directed fast packet. <sighs> Go dive deep in the hole again. When I showed that diagram that what a packet consists of, there was only eight bytes. And that's a very small amount of information. You can send maybe the voltage and the temperature, or maybe the current. You, know, you can send two or three things, but if, uh, if you want to send more, you have to send a separate packet. It's a very small bit of information. It's basically eight letters. So what you can send in each packet. All of these protocols have the ability to send groups of packets. It'll be called fast packet or it's, you know, there's a couple of different protocols. In NEMA 2000, they have a block of message IDs that they reserve for what they call fast packets. And it's a way they can send, I think it's 1932 bytes. Instead of eight, you can say a whole bunch. And that group starts out with a message that goes out and says, I'm going to send some fast packets. So the next 23 messages that I send is the first eight bytes, the next eight bytes, the next eight bytes, right? Uh, that is a very structured protocol. The sender has to know what it looks like. The receiver has to recognize it and be ready to grab all these messages and reassemble them because it's not getting one packet, it's getting a bunch of packets it has to reassemble and then hand off for somebody to process. Some of the DC source messages in RVC use the same identifier as some of these fast packets. Now, in the real world, what happens is, we've never, I've never heard of an issue. In the real world, what happens is, a NEMA 2000 display is going to receive this rogue packet that shows up, because it's an RVC thing with the battery temperature or something. Right? It's going to receive that message and it's going to say, well, this looks like a fast packet message, but I didn't get into this preamble. It's like, this thing's like broke. This has just showed up on doorstep. I, did, I don't know what to do with it. I didn't get the header. I didn't get all the rest of them before it. So I'm just going to ignore it. That's usually what happens. It arrives at NEMI 2000. It looks like an ill-formed fast packet fragment and it's just ignored. Yes, sir. Does it pass it on, or does it, when you say ignore, does it continue to pass it on through a backbone? Or does it uh, the backbone, remember, the backbone, everyone's hearing everything. So it's the node. The node's going to get that packet. So the battery's going to send out, here's, the, here's 
I, I don't remember which one it is. Maybe it's the voltage pack. Batteries go send out the RVC voltage. Everyone gets it. Wake speeds go over here and say, hey, thank you, battery. This Lean Me 2000 display is going to say, what the heck is this? This is like some malformed fragment of a fast packet message. I'm just going to ignore it. That's good programming standards. That's how almost everyone works. I found one device that was a very small European. It was some guy who made you know, a commercial product, very small cell. He hadn't put that code in. He found that fragmented packet and it wedged his display. But that was like, I don't want to use the word hobbyist because it was a commercial product, but it was a very small scale. You know, they maybe sold like 20, right? I mean, it's just a very small thing. So I'm belaboring on this point because these two guys, they love each other, but they do fight over this topic. And this is where that can bridge comes into play. If you have something really weird going on, and again, I've never had this show up in the real world, and, we, and I know of you know, 40 or 50 really involved NEMA 2000 display installs. Never heard this be an issue. But if it does, the answer is you get a bridge. A couple of companies make them. And you have the NEMA 2000 backbone here. You have the RVC backbone here. Here's all the NEMA 2000 stuff. Here's all the RVC stuff, including wake speed. You put the bridge in the middle. And then that bridge will only receive the NEMA 2000 packets and pass it on to this NEMA 2000 backbone. If you go to the back of our reference manual, we actually have a little script that you can use with, uh, I think Yacht Dynamics is, is one of the devices. There's a script in there that shows how you can configure it to accomplish that. Okay. Have I belabored this point enough? So it's like having its own internal network, like its own hotspot pass through. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're used to like computer, like Ethernet and stuff, it's basically a, a filtering router is what it is. It just only passes through what should pass through, and the rest of the stuff stays. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. So you got devices, the guys <laughs> up in Vancouver, British Columbia, that's, that would also be a, a good source for... I think that's the example of the bridge. Yacht Devices is the little bridge device that we had one of our customers, I don't know, just because he was bored and he wanted to do this. So um, he created that script and we kind of verified it and we threw it in our appendix. So um, that's what's back there. It's for this bridge to filter out. Think of it, this is how I describe, this is how I like to think of it in metaphors. Think of it as two brothers, two bedrooms, a shared bathroom, and they're like just really angry with who gets to use it first. At some point, mom's going to come up and say, you get to use it at this time, and you get to use it this time. That's what that little bridge is, basically. Okay? Real world, never known it to be needed. If you get a customer who is aware of some of this topic, but not aware of how, whether it's relevant or not, you may get pestered on this. And if you do, there's your, that's what's going on, so you can have an intelligent conversation with the person. Okay. Ah, uh, it was mentioned before, engine data. So do you remember yesterday we talked about how the wake speed regulator considers the battery information either through independent sensors or can communicate if the battery's going to communicate that way. It considers the alternator, what's going on with the alternator. It can also consider what's going on with the engine. And kind of two of the areas that's really cool things that we can do with the engine data. We can pick up the RPMs. So that stator wire that we talked about is so problematic. If you've got a CAN enabled modern engine, and by the way, that one out there is not, nor is the one in my vessel. There's a lot of marine engines that don't have this modern electronics on it. But if you do, like the new Vols and stuff, they'll have a CAN bus. And literally what you do is you go find wherever the terminator is. I don't know why I have my terminator here. You go find where the terminator is, unplug it, you plug in the extension into the wake speed, and now the wake speed can see the engine data. It can know what the RPMs are. So if you're going to do any of that white space that we're going to talk about, we need to know what the RPMs are, bang, we get the RPMs that way. If uh, you want to know the engine loading, which is actually a great way to manage engine loading, 
so that you're not overloading the engine at low RPMs or high RPMs, that's how you can get. You remember the example, Nordhavens, and I gave you one example of somebody who had a wing engine with a hydraulics pump on it? That's how we did this. We tapped into the wing engine's J1939 bus, we received the engine loading, and when they hit the hydraulic pump, and we set the regulator to say, don't ever let the engine go over 60% engine loading. So when they hit that hydraulic pump and that engine went up to 90, 100, 110%, we backed the alternator off, tried to bring that back to 60, and it just worked. The secret is you have to get the data. Once you get the data, it's easy to set up. Yes, sir? That just seems like one of the best features you guys have put in there. If you're relying on a diesel engine and you're asking it to do hydraulic pump work mm -hmm. that's, you know, robust in its nature, like a thruster, to be able to sense the engine and process that data and tweak the alternator is just yep. really... Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, I actually agree with you. It's one of the best features. It's also the ones of the most least used features in the wake speed, that engine load management. So when we get into the configuration, we're going to get to the engine tab, and we're going to revisit this topic. That engine loading is just set and forget. Now, if you can't get that engine data, we have other ways of delivering the same value. You could, for example, use white space. Because remember, that engine loading, that engine loading at low RPMs, I'm trying to move the boat around, and I got a big giant alternator sucking 4 kilowatts out, and I try to maneuver, that engine loading's gonna go to 110%. Wake speed will back off, right? That engine loading handles that. It handles when we're trying to get up on step. When that really struggling point of, that in, of you're trying to get the boat up on plane, that's a real high energy need for putting horsepower into the water. That engine loading is going to spike, wake speed will back off. When you're up at the top, where the engine curve on planing vessels intersects with the prop loading, and you're overloading the engine, because now we're pulling 20 horsepower of the engine, and you're getting black smoke out the back, we'll back off the alternator automatically. All this stuff happens automatically. Just connect up to the engine can and set the engine loading parameter. Yes, ma'am. I've been trying to figure out from context clues what you mean by white space. Yeah. I haven't got it yet. So no. Would you go through that a little bit? We will, and we'll go into much more detail. So what white space lets us do, and the perfect example is at the very bottom end, a white space is a way to deliver this value I just talked about but we do it based on RPMs. So we say, if we're really low RPMs, then let's not let the alternator drive hard. Let's cap how hard the output the alternator can do. So there's actually little sliders based on RPMs, and we say at low RPMs, we're only going to let the alternator work this much. And as RPMs go up, we'll slide up and, and go down. It, it becomes, and I'll explain much more detail, but it's a way to deliver this kind of same value, where at low RPMs, you back the alternator off, and at high RPMs, you back the alternator off, and at the hump, you have a way of backing it off. Without having J1939 data, you have to have RPM data, though. Could you maybe say what the name means? Yeah. OK, sure. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> Good luck. Can, can you guys see over here, if I draw here? OK. Um, Here's like RPMs. In grade school, I, my teacher said that we had to put our arm like this or she's going to have the custodian come in and make a shelf. So I still remember that. Dark, dark periods. And here's something we're just going to call this power for whatever. So a typical engine, as you increase RPMs at idle, it doesn't make a lot of, doesn't make a lot of power. And a typical engine has a curve that looks like this, right? And as you go up higher, you've all seen this. In a vessel, the prop loading curve will look like this. Have you guys seen this? So at very low RPMs, a prop doesn't have the ability to put much power in the water. The prop loading is very low. On Viking Star, the maximum amount of power, my prop, and there's formulas, all sorts of science around this. I can put 58 horsepower 
into the water at max RPMs. At low RPMs, well, when you're not moving, you're putting zero in. So this starts at zero and then goes up. The thing is, these curves don't match. These curves are different. On a plane, now on Viking Star, my engine curve actually looks like this. I mean, it's way off the top. The engine produces 120 horsepower at max, so I'm never able to fully load it. I've actually propped my vessel. And if you guys get into this, it's what's called overprop. I usually run in this space to try to get these curves closer to gear to be more fuel efficient on that efficiency, right? But this is a typical horsepower, engine horsepower prop curve. Um, there are some subtleties, and I'm going to put a little bump here like this. And I don't, you know, this, when you have a plane vessel, you're going to get a little spike and then it returns back down. That's when you're trying to get over the hump and up on plane. There's like, you need a little bit extra push. On planing vessels, typically, that's the most efficient point of operating because it's the, where you're going to burn your fuel the most efficiently because of the hull form. On planing vessels, when the engineers, when the boat designers make their vessels and design the engine to the prop, they will often design this point to intersect because people who own planing vessels, they want to go fast. And when they fire all that throttle, they want to think they're back in a PT-73 and they want to go fast and they want to make sure that every horsepower of that engine can go into the prop. What that means is, not on Viking Star, that means you've got a planing vessel, you're producing 400 horsepower and you're delivering 400 horsepower into the water. You're putting as much power into the water to move that vessel as the engine can produce. There's no room left for the alternator. So at this point, the engine's at 100% loading. Yeah, they usually don't do 100%. They leave a little, you leave headway, you leave margin in there for various reasons. Usually I'm bring them up to about 90% loading in the real world. But what you want to do in this point, look, if we're pulling 30, 40 horsepower of the engine for the alternator, we can't do that at this point. We have to back it off. Same way down here, if we're trying to pull 20 horsepower out of the engine, we can't do it because the engine can't make horsepower. White space is this distance this area in between. This is opportunity to apply additional loading from the alternator. And maybe when we apply the alternator and the prop, we end up with a curve that looks more like this. So down here, almost all of our power is on the green line. It's going to the prop and we're putting two or three horsepower into the alternator. Up here, all of our engine's horsepower is going into the prop. We're putting 390 horsepower into the prop. The engine makes 400. We're basically putting four horsepower. Here in the middle, we have lots of opportunity because the prop can only take 40 horsepower and the engine makes 100. We can load up 40 or 50 horsepower into the alternator. So what you will do is you will define a white space curve for the regular that looks like this, looks like a football. And when you get into that, you'll see it. You can define these little sliders and you'll make a slider that's low here, low here, high here. And you may choose to make a little bump here because that, you know, reduce the alternator horsepower output, alternator demand on the horsepower to get us up on plane. Does that explain that all? Okay, where the phrase white space come from has nothing to do with this. Because that's the question you really ask. Um, do you remember in school when you turned your reports in and you got all the nasty diagram uh, comments from your instructor. They'd write them on the white space on the paper. Those are the margins on the edge of the paper, the white space of the paper. That's where that phrase actually came from, uh, but we've kind of absorbed it and we used it for this. This is unused potential, just like you had unused paper, unused potential where you could uh, apply to the old Yes, sir. Okay. You sold me. I want to know about the white space. How do I do this on a non NEMA 2000 or a network? Exactly. And that's the difference. The easiest way to accomplish this value of making sure that we don't have dodgy performance at low RPMs and that we don't overload the engine at high RPMs, tap into the engine data, set the loading curve and say, 
Never load this engine up more than 90%. So what we'll do, if this is the output of the engine, we'll just simply say, hey, alternator, make sure we never no load. And you know, pick a number or 90%, pick like 60% or something like that. We'll just say, never load the engine more than that. And that way, the alternator will back off down at these points here where there's not any extra space and at these points where there's not extra space. If you can't do that, and that is the best way to do it, it's the easiest way to do it, hook up two wires, set one number, and go to lunch. If you can't do that, then you have to get the RPMs into the wake speed somehow, either through a stator wire or through a J1939 or through a NEMA 2000, and you declare the white space. In addition, um, there are other things that the uh, engine loading solves automatically. If you're doing cogen, like that example of the hydraulic pump, if you use engine loading, that number, it automatically happens. Because you throw that hydraulic pump on, engine loading goes high, wake speed says, oh, too much, we'll back off the alternator. If you don't have access to the data, you can define the RPMs of the white space. Then, to deliver the value of the engine loading on that hydraulic, we're really getting into advanced features now, you would take the white feature in wire and you would connect that up to whatever it is, that, uh, the clutch on that hydraulic pump. So when that clutch is on the hydraulic pump, you would select a different mode of operation of the wake speed. So very specifically, you remember yesterday we talked about normal mode, half power mode. We talked about normal mode and small alt mode with the little dip switch eight. Do you guys remember that? Do you remember saying there was a third parameter called half power? You can configure the feature in wire to select half power. And what you would do in this case is you would have to figure out in your head how much I have to back the alternator off to account for that hydraulic pump. So when you're normally running, you may run the alternator up to 100%. When that hydraulic pump is running, you may say, I can only drive the alternator at 20%. So you would set that parameter at 20%, hook this up to your hydraulic pump, hook this up to your stator wire, go in and find the white spaces. This is how with a legacy or an analog connection, you can accomplish these customer values. Now, if you want to do it the easy way, figure out where to connect this up and set a number on that same tab that says 60%. And all that stuff will get done. Okay? Yes, sir? Is that also how you use like a preset for high idle? So say I'm on, I'm, on, I'm on a sailboat, I want to high idle my engine and just charge my batteries as fast as possible. Would it, is that what I would use? That kind of preset? Or is that a separate feature? You could definitely do that. I mean, these are where we're getting in the system designs. Wake speed's very flexible, has a lot of features. These are some of the things you can do. So for example, let's say at um, this RPM right here, I want another color, right here, perfect. Let's say at this RPM right here is my high idle. Well, when I'm moving the boat, I'm going to do this much to the alternator, but I've capped it because I've defined white space. But I actually have more room available to drive the alternator because I'm not driving a prop. So I could actually use this energy and direct it toward driving the alternator. You can configure the feature in wire to only use white space during certain times. So for example, if the vessel's moving, you could say apply white space. And if it's not, you could say ignore white space. Just drive the alternator as it can. React when it's in that white space, and then I understand you're not using the prop, or what yeah. happens when there's a malfunction with the engine, or it's starting to run out of spec. How does it, I mean, how fast? Say, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure if you heard the questions. He's going, What happens when things go in the ditch? Yeah. Right? Um, it, the, the failure modes is something, that, definitely something to think about and consider. Uh, what'll happen is, uh, you can, <sighs> there are many ways to skin this cat. So let's say, for example, you run out of fuel and the engine stops, right? Well, you could use that little oil pressure twig, 
If you did that, that'll turn the regulator off, right? You could define the parameter in the wake speed. If it knows the RPMs, there's actually a parameter you can say if the RPMs are below a certain amount, turn the engine, you know, turn it off. That's another way you could skin that cat. Um, if you had things going sideways, like you drop the injector, I don't know what's going to happen. If you got a legacy, uh, old mechanical engine. Tired. I mean, yeah. Sailboats. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. If you drop a cylinder, if you drop an injector, you're probably just going to get a ton of black smoke out of the back and get a service call. If it's an electron controlled engine, the ECU might recognize it and signal to the wake speed, hey, something's going wrong. So can't really answer all those things. Yeah. But it is a marvelous question, and I really hope every one of you, since we're spending two days here, I hope you not only understand how to install basic wake speed, but also how to do some of these higher reliability features. We're going to talk about this after lunch, but there are things like what happens if I'm connected to the CAN with the BMS and that connection goes away? What do you want the regulator to do? There's lots of options you can do. What happens if? I lose engine RPMs. What do you want to do? Lots of options there. There's a lot of things the wake speed can detect, and you can declare how you want the behavior of the system, the regulator to behave, as part of your system design. Okay? Does that answer your question? Yep. Perfect. Yes, sir. Uh, as far as getting the power curves to determine the wet fit, is that the kind of thing where you would have to go to your engine manufacturer? Engine manufacturer, yeah. And, and they may or may not give them to you. And they may be marketing documents, you know, basically, <laughs> liar sheets, but you know, that's, yeah, that's where you would go, right. Yes, sir. So, I know we have some commercial fisher folk in this yes. room. Yeah. And it just occurs to me that uh, commercial fishing boats, the exposure I've had to them, had to them, there is no limit to what one of those main propulsion engines will think is a great source for PTO, fill in the blanks. Exactly. We're going to run this. We're going to run hydraulic pumps directly yeah. off the crankshaft. We're yep. going to do it with electric clutches. We're going to run multiple alternators. We're going to do all this stuff. Yeah. So in a legacy engine, yeah. um, well, how would you advise the, the techs in this room that are eventually going to find themselves in a problem-solving situation on a source of fishing boat? Would you say keep it simple and get as much data as you can to feed into the wake speed for configuring it to optimize the alternator and the battery management? Or would you say it, in some cases it might make sense to advise uh, the owner, the vessel owner, oh, you know, this is a candidate for converting a legacy engine to be more like a can enabled engine by changing all the sensors? Yeah. So, um, I am remembering when I went to school. And when I went to school, my computer science degree, one of them was called Computer I.O. And we dealt with what was known as the very first commercially viable IBM, an IBM 1401. Came out in the 50s. And it was a marvelous machine. And it did DTL and, you know, this old guy, little spark plug of a person, had retired from IBM and had all sorts of stories that he, you know, would impress college students with, and 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 give us little things by pulling out boards and putting scotch tape over it and saying, "Oh, this doesn't work. Find it." Right. One of the things that was fabulous about that machine, and that's the machine that started, like when you got computer printed mailings, it came from a printer, uh, 1407, I think it was called. When they had the tapes that went around came from there. When it, all that stuff started with that machine, the printer itself was called a chain printer and it was heads and tails better than anything else I ever invented. It was also better than anything else that came out 20 years later. A lot of those 1401s existed purely to drive the printer. The printer was a legacy analog machine where you added this pump here and you pumped there and you did everything. It was rated at 600 lines per minute. We had a competition that the instructor gave us. How fast can you make this printer go? Now this is a mechanical machine. It was old, it was tired. I think the record was like 684 lines per minute before you start getting crap on the print on the page. So that was our competition. One of the stories that he would pass on is because these things could be tweaked, 
if he had a customer that he liked, his personal record was 790 lines per minute. And he would come in once a week and turn this little knob and turn this one shot and adjust this to get that 790 lines per minute. For the customers who were wankers, that machine was set for 400 lines uh, per minute and he never saw him again. He'd come in once a year when he was told he had to. Coming back to your question, I can't answer you. So you got to depend on who the customer is. Is this a customer, and it's not a case of a customer you like or you don't like. It's a case of what are the needs? You know, fishing commercial vessels, they are there to serve a purpose. They're a tool. So you have to make sure that whatever you put in satisfies that needs first and foremost, right? So if you've got all this kind of stuff going on and you want to take advantage of some of this stuff, well, maybe you set it up for 400 lines per minute. You are very conservative, right? You get one signal wire in and, and you just deal with one thing and it gives good values and because you're a 32 volt system and they're burning up batteries all the time and now you're not going to burn up batteries, they're very happy about it, right? But that is the right answer for that customer. Or you've got somebody that says, I've read all these glossy magazines, I'm all these forums, I don't want to be on the leading edge. Well then fine, you can tune it up to 750 lines per minute. And if you've got multiple pumps on it, you may even sit down and buy a beer for your favorite engineer who's going to teach you what an orange diode system looks like. Whoops and tell you to run that to your feature end wire, run that to hydraulic pump one, and that to hydraulic pump two, and that to hydraulic pump three, and if any one of those guys go active, you'll activate that guy. All right, so that's my answer to that, and, and, and the real truthful answer is, you have to know what the customer wants, what he's looking for out of his vessel. Is, he, is this something that's not gonna be around for long, fishing vessels around forever? You know, how much how much do they want to be pushing an optimizing thing? There's a phrase, the evil of good is better. Good is good. Just because you can make it better doesn't mean you should. So in the spirit of, you know, less is more, keep it simple. But, you know, in my, in my example, yeah. I think we can all agree what a, what a commercial fishing boat <laughs> captain wants is a robustness and reliability <coughs> yep. to do the work that it's yep. there to do. Yep. So, uh, but increasingly efficiency is, is important. This stuff ain't cheap. You know, if you could go out, if you could, you know, back in the day when you could go to a dyno in Seattle and pick up a bunch of batteries for 400 bucks, who cares if you burned them every two years? Diesel fuel costs 49 cents a gallon. Who cares? Now we're in an environment where it's five, six, seven thousand dollars for those batteries and diesel fuel is like four bucks a minute, right? So it's a different world. So those are the things that, that you might want to uh, consider a bit. All right, so um, I got two more slides and then we will break. Um, no, before we do that, I'm going to come back to one thing here. Vehicles. All of these engine loading values I've been talking about has been very much in the marine space. This applies to trucks and cars even more so. Perfect example. Those little Sprinter vans, some of them come with little teeny turbo diesels. Turbo diesels are great. They make a lot of power when you get them up on their legs. When they're starting, they make nothing. You're like opening the door and putting your foot out, trying to get it going. We had a customer, actually, who bought one of our products, installed it, and he loves it. And then I get a phone call. He, uh, he had gotten back from a camping trip in the Cascades. And he had parked his van overnight on the incline at 3,500 feet. He couldn't get the truck to move. The alternator was pulling so much power at idle that they couldn't get the truck to start. There was so little energy available. His solution is the solution you're going to hear about all the time. Well, I'll just put a switch on the dashboard, turn the regulator off. How many people have helms with switches everywhere to turn this off, turn this off, right? It's the old school solution. And it worked for him. Turned it off, he could get up the hill. Had he connected in to the chassis J939 bus, 
we would have realized that we we're pulling 70, 80, 90% engine loading. We would have backed the alternator off automatically. We would have solved this problem. No switch needed. Another area, you're trying to accelerate. You're trying to get that tur sorry, that pig up an on-ramp, right? Get up to the freeway speed because you don't want to get crushed. Put the metal to the pedal. We'll realize engine loading's high. We'll back the alternator off. You're trying to make a pass. You're going up a hill. All this stuff will happen automatically if you tap into the engine data. And it's a massive value. And I will tell you, I know of no one who is using it today. It's been there for years. No one's using it today. Massive value in the RV space. Massive differentiator. You have a product that will be better than anyone else's because no one else can do this in this way. By the way, that same guy, he called me here the other day. He's up uh, in the North Country on the North Slope. He said, oh man, this wake speed's broke. It's not charging my batteries. And now I'm out in the you know, toolies and I need this thing to charge. You hit the nail on the head. <laughs> it took him a little while to realize he had turned the alternator off for some reason and forgot to turn it back on again. And yes, he was very embarrassed. And yes, we had the conversation about how unreliable carbon-based control units are. They're horrible. They just are. Deliver the value in a way that's going to work. And it works. And it works beautifully. And it's proven. It's been there for years. It's a marvelous value. In the marine space, I will guarantee you, you're going to run across people all the time. We, do, we have it all the time now. We have guys that want to put a switch on their helm in the brown wire so they can turn the regular off. They want to put a switch in the white wire so they can force the regular into half power mode. And it's just like, why are you doing this? Well, I need to control stuff. It's like white space. Hook up one wire and Bob's your uncle and you're done. But there you go. The old world versus the new world. Okay. Um, some more subtleties and details. Oh, sorry. Subtleties and details. There is a aspect of CAN that you will need to know called instance. Do you remember I said that all these protocols define how the data is used, what it means? Many of these packets have what's known as an instance. And it's a way to differentiate different, ver different realizations of the same device. Perfect example is you've got a twin engine installed with two wake speed regulators. If they send out the CAN messages reporting their status with the same instance, whoever's receiving them won't know where it's port or starboard. So instead, what they do is this becomes instance one and this becomes instance two. So that way, when that NEMA 2000 display receives this information, it knows whether it's the port engine or the starboard engine. Instances come into play with the battery and the BMSs. There are battery instances. There are uh, charger instances, which are relative to the wake speed. And then there are engine instances. And this is going to become a problem for you guys in the marine world. All these J1939 messages that I just got talking about that do marvelous things, they all come out with a preamble that says, I am instant zero. And that's going to be this engine. If you have a twin engine, you want this engine to come out and say, I'm instance one, and here's my loading. And it can be done. It absolutely can be done. It is never done. Every twin engine install, both engines come with engine instance zero. And here's why. Because you've got really big boat manufacturers who think they're really big and really important, and they're going to call up John Deere and say, yeah, I need instant zero for my port and instant one for my starboard. And John Deere's going to say, okay, 20 container minimum for instance one. Where do you want us to deliver it? And it's like, that doesn't happen. So what it means is it can happen, but it never does. In reality, what's going to happen in your world, both those J1939 messages, the first floor, they're all going to be with instance zero. And this is where NEMA 2000 comes in and helps you. So the wake speed regulator can pick up engine loading data. We can pick it up from the first floor through J1939. 
We can also pick it up on that brother that lives in this bedroom, the Neiman 2000 bedroom, because that has a message that talks about RPMs and, and engine loading. So if you want to use this type of feature, if you want to feed engine data into the wake speed, what you're going to do, you're going to have to add a little engine data bridge. And they're pervasive. They all exist. They come in one of two forms. One form is they have two CAN buses. One connects to a J1939. There goes to NEMA 2000. You go in and configure it, and you say where this is engine 0 or 1, and you do the name and all the stuff. You have to configure the device. And then the wake speed, and you do the same thing with the air engine. And that way, the wake speed gets messages that says, here's my port loading. Here's my starboard loading. You have to configure the regular air where which engine instance to listen to, there are, you know, one or two. And then that's how that all works. These little devices also come with legacy analog sensors. You can buy them that have an oil pressure sensor and an RPM and a voltage and just wires that come out and digitize it and present it as NEMA 2000. That's another way you can accomplish the same thing. This is a detail that you in the marine industry are going to have to be aware of. It's a complexity, and that's, that's what the issue is, and that's how you would solve it. Yes, sir. So If I set up my wake speed and in six months I try to figure out what I did, mm -hmm. is there a way to actually uh, go in and see what I did? Or well, my answer would be you would go to your ship's document that you have saved away and you could see everything you did, including the configuration and everything. Uh, there is actually inside the wake speed, you can pull the configuration out with the app. You can retrieve it. It loses some details. So the app, we talk about what's the brand of the battery and what's the model number. You lose that detail because the wake speed doesn't care what brand it is. It just needs to know how big it is, right? It doesn't need to know what color it is. But yes, there is a way to do it. But my recommendation, my, and that's usually why this is done. My suggestion when you're doing an install, take your notes, configure the regulator, save that configuration file away, have a folder on your computer, part of your ship's records, give that to the customer so they have it as well. That would be my recommendation. Okay. And by the way, I would also recommend when you do that, take a copy of the firmware that is presently being used, save that as a way. So down the road, if you have to do a replacement, you can put in exactly the same thing that was done. Even if we're two or three generations ahead, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If it had been working for 20 years and you got struck by lightning, unless you have a compelling reason to use a newer version of firmware, I'm conservative. I say, if it worked for, 20, or, you know, for five or 10 years, put it back exactly the same way. Now, it could be there are new features that you want to take advantage of. Of course, then you would update. But that would be my recommendation. Save away your design drawings. Save away the actual configuration file, the, the text files. And then also save away a copy of the firmware. Okay. Can we go back through and like when you release those firmware packets, are, do you store those previous versions? Like if we need to get a legacy. We. Um, we actually don't make them publicly available, but you can contact our support. I mean, we have them. We just don't have them out there. Okay. Yeah. If I need that old one. If you need to, you can contact support and they'll help you out. But no, it's not. Listed on the website, you know, we just list the most latest one. And we list the latest one and encourage people to use the latest one, right? All right. Um, so bottom line, this engine ID instance, if you've got a single engine, it's easy. Just connect the wake speed up to the CAN bus. We'll receive all this data off the first floor, J1939. If you have twin engines, you're going to have to do this translation with NEMA 2000 so that we have separate engine instance because this engine, his first floor is going to say he's engine zero, he'll translate into engine two. This one's going to say he's engine zero, he'll translate into engine one, and then the wake speed can listen on the NEMA 2000 bus. So that's kind of the bottom line. Single engine, connect it up, twin engine, you gotta do this NEMA 2000 uh, converter. Any questions on this? All right, we got one more slide. And uh, then, then we're going to go into the configuration of the wake speed, which I, I think we'll just take a break. So first off, we're going to talk about this. 
These are kind of some hints, and we've kind of alluded to these a little bit already. How do you do troubleshooting? Okay. The very first thing is if all, everything's working, how do you know it's working? With the Wake Speed 500, if we have a CAN BMS, the very first thing you're going to look for is the LED. It will display three colors. It'll display green, which means it's in standalone mode. It'll display red, which means there's either a, a failure, it's one of the failure modes, or it's in a fault mode. Or it'll display yellow, amberish type color. That means it's in slave mode. So if you have lead acid batteries in twin engine install, and you've connected up two regulators with a terminator plugged in on this side and a Cat5 cable over the other side and a terminator. When you fire those two engines up, one of the regulators, I don't know which one, one's going to stay green, the other one's going to color shift to the yellow amber. What that means is this is the master, this is the one that's controlling the charge process, and that guy's in slave mode. He will follow the directions from this guy. That's another one of the values of the wake speed. We don't have them fighting each other when charging the battery. They'll work with each other. This guy is the boss, the one blinking green. He says, here's what we're going to do. And the guy that's blinking yellow, amber, he's in slave mode. So a very quick and easy bring up and test, look for that color shift on one of these two. If you have a BMS, part of the CAM protocol, a BMS can say, I also know what's going on with the battery and I'm smarter than you. When the wake speed sees that, this is part of the RVC protocol, he will see the BMS as a higher priority. This green guy will do the color shift and he'll also become a slave. So in that scenario where you've got a BMS connected to a wake speed regular, you want to look for the color shift. First and foremost, that's the easiest bring up. Look for the color shift. It takes about 10 seconds. Rick yesterday mentioned there's that engine warm up delay. We can, the shortest you can do it is 15 seconds. The reason why is the wake speed regulator is looking around to see if there's somebody it needs to lock onto as a slave. So that's the first and foremost, you want to see that color shift. If you don't see that color shift and you expected it, you likely have a problem with your CAN backbone or a configuration issue. You need to troubleshoot that. No color shift, it's not going to be working. You need to verify the protocols. Uh, you also need to look at the wiring. You need to look at the, uh, the backbones and everything. If you've got something else on the CAN network, you want to make sure the CAN network itself is working. There are some times that the CAN can be brought down because you've got too many terminators or you haven't hooked up any terminators. So if you happen to have a NEMA 2000 display, see if the NEMA 2000 display is receiving information from the wake speed. See if your servo is receiving information from the wake speed. See if the servo sees information from the battery. Use other things, other nodes on this CAN network. The reason you have a CAN network, all these guys talk with each other. See if any of these other guys can talk with each other. See if the AIS is able to send uh, position information to the chart plotter. If all that stuff works and you don't see the color shift, well, your backbone's probably okay. You need to focus on making sure you have this configured correctly. If none of this other stuff works, then your backbone's probably down. You need to focus on what's going on there. Okay? Um, I think that's about it. I think we're ready for a break. Two days, 120 slides. There are rules of thumb for how many minutes you do on a slide. We have covered a lot of detail. We are now going to cover how to configure the wake speed regulator. And guess what? That is 12 slides. A tenth of this entire presentation. This is how good we are. We only need a tenth of the information to tell you how to configure the regulator and take advantage of all these great features. Um, there are quite a few ways to configure the regulator. The very simplest way is connect this regulator up to an RVC compliant battery. Do you remember when we talked about CAM protocols and we said the fundamental thing that this thing runs on is RVC? You pull this out of the box, you connect this wire up to the battery and you go have lunch. 
providing, if you'll remember the other day, we talked about the defaults we use for the alternator. If those match your needs, 100 degrees C, 90% drive, if those are within the criteria of your alternator, that's literally all you have to do. The wake speed regulator will recognize that there's somebody smarter than it out there. It will do its color shift to orange, yellow, and start following the BMS, providing it is a proper and fully compliant RVC battery. We list those on our website, the ones we've tested, but there are increasingly numbers of, an increasing number of RVC batteries coming on market. So be aware of that. That is absolutely the easiest way. Click it, click and go. Yes, sir. Are there some improperly configured batteries on the market that you guys run across? Um, and if so, is there also a stay away list that you guys provide? There is not a stay away list that we provide because it's bad form. Uh, there is a list of batteries that we know absolutely work. And then in terms of your other question what about the in-betweens, you know, I'm aware of three RVC batteries, new ones on the market. I have two of them in my lab, one of them I don't have. The two actually do a pretty good job. Um, the devil in the detail is that it meets the spec. We talked about messages of forewarning, of the BMS getting upset and saying, stop doing that. Of the BMS saying, you really better stop doing that or I'm going to call you home. And the BMS saying, I'm done, I'm out, and does a disconnect. That is all defined in the RVC spec. What's also defined in the RVC spec is this magic two seconds heads up. Before a BMS does a disconnect, it must send a CAN message that says, we are going to issue a disconnect command two seconds before it actually disconnects. And the reason for that is it takes an alternator about half a second to spool that energy down. The reason why I wrote two, and I'm the one who wrote two seconds in, the reason I wrote two seconds is it lets me lose one or two of those CAN messages. They come out twice a second. See, see how that works? If he's sending, I'm going to do a disconnect, and that one gets swallowed or lost or corrupted, I'm going to do a disconnect, I can lose two, get the third one, have time to safely shut down. That's kind of the thinking that went back in all this stuff. If a battery is truly designed to the RVC spec, plug and go and you're safe. Whether or not a battery is truly designed to the RVC spec, I can't answer. And specifically the area that is often a trouble is that forewarning, because it's a unique thing for alternator regulators because of the high residual magnetism in the alternator. Solar panel controllers, don't care. You can say, you can disconnect instantly and the solar panel control will be fine. Uh, AC chargers, disconnect instantly. It's actually not true. AC chargers, some of the really big ones, they have residual induction in it and it'll be an issue. Uh, alternators, the wake speed instantly responds and it takes its foot off that, the blue wire. Stops driving the alternator. It's called an inductive kick. Lots of energy has to go somewhere. And if you can't go in the battery, it goes into your refrigerator and your electronics and you end up writing a $20,000 check and putting the fire out in your refrigerator. So that's the danger and I can't answer the question unless literally we have an example of our battery in our lab and we can verify it. And the easiest way to know that is to see if it's on the wake speed app. If it's on here, we have an example of it. If it's not, we don't know. And I will tell you, there were some batteries that we supported and they stopped talking to me. I'm the guy who signs off on this stuff. When the engineer on the other side doesn't pick up the phone or answer my emails, we pull their batteries off because we don't know. There's changes happening in the industry and one particular battery manufacturer specifically, they'd gone through a number of ownership changes. We had no idea what their new batteries looked like and they wouldn't answer my emails, so we pulled them from our, our list. I just didn't know. I know it's not a comfortable answer, uh, but that's the reality. And if you want to test it yourself, you can get an alternator without avalanche diodes, drive it real hard, put those battery in and disconnect, and see if your refrigerator catches on fire. That's the way you could test it at home. <laughs> All right, but that is absolutely the easiest and the simplest way, and there's, there are batteries out now 
that uh, support RVC. There are batteries coming. And I am going to do a little avatorial here right now. Today, I'm wearing the Legacy WakeSpeed logo. You can't get these anymore. This is a classic. Rick has one on his hat. But you'll notice his shirt says Dragonfly Energy. Remember, Dragonfly makes lithium batteries. They make Battleborn batteries. By the way, I get paid extra for this. This is, uh, goes into my bonus. They make Battleborn batteries, branded batteries. They also make Dragonfly Energy branded batteries. They're largely the same. One's targeted for consumers, one's targeted for the OEM market. This January, we announced a um, evolution, improvement. We announced a new series of batteries called Dragonfly Intelligence. That's going to add several features to our batteries, to our Dragonfly batteries. Uh, it will add the ability for the battery to communicate out to the consumer. There's a cell phone app that comes with those batteries, so you can go on and know what's going on with the batteries. It'll also add the ability for the batteries to communicate via CAN, via RVC, to the wake speed regulator. It'll also communicate out to NEMA 2000, it'll communicate out to the Victron, it's bringing this whole communication world in, and um, it's going to be rolling out over this period of time. You know, it was announced in January, and I'm not allowed to talk about dates, and, I, and yes, I did ask last night what I could say, <laughs> and I was told to say, eh, sometime this year. So be looking for it as you're thinking about your batteries. Um, I hope maybe one of the dots you connect. Wake Speed has a very long history with these high energy systems. Wake Speed joined Dragonfly Energy a year ago. Dragonfly Energy is making a new line of batteries to deliver high energy systems. And I'll let you connect the dots from there. Okay, did I earn my keep? I got a thumbs up, thank you. All right, um, the next simplest way to configure the regulator, if you're doing a legacy, this is like lead acid battery specifically is probably the best thing. Um, hook up your shunt, hook up your temperature sensor, set your dip switches. We used to have a little card, and I saw one floating around, and I didn't bring any with me. Just a little, you know, half sheet card that showed the dip switch settings. You can go online, you can see it. You can go and see the um, um, user's manual and stuff, and I'll talk about what the dip switch settings say. You set the dip switches for what the battery charge profile is. You set the dip switches for approximately the battery capacity, and that'll be good enough, especially for a lead acid battery. That's the second easiest way to set, to set to do this. I will give a caution. One of the charge profiles, is it number five? Yeah. I think it's number five. We made a change. In prior versions of firmware, it selected carbon foam, AKA, Firefly branded batteries. Firefly, I know we've talked a little bit about, they've been, had some troubles. We have taken that out from the built-in charge profile. And now, conveniently, it has the Battleborn charge profile. So just know that when you find that documentation, if it says Firefly or carbon foam, that's not what that dip switch setting does. So like dips, I think dips three, four, and five are the ones you select your battery. Is it AGM? Is it, you know, is it a, a Battleborn? Is it lead acid? You know, that's how you select the battery type. Um, I believe dips uh, seven and eight select the approximate capacity. How many amp hours is it? Uh, or six and seven. Six and seven does battery capacity, and then number eight is the small out mode. That's the second easiest way. Hook up your shunt, hook up your temperature sensor to the battery, set your dip switches, and Bob's your uncle. Uh, if you've got two regulators, connect them together with the CAN bus. Make sure you put the appropriate black terminators on each end. One regulator will be green, the other will be orange. That means that guy's enslaved. And that's a pretty good indication that you have a working system. Yes, sir? So, as, uh, since you mentioned there's a couple nameless brands in, mm -hmm. under testing in your lab, as those do or do not get added to the uh, approved list, it's, it's a living list. Yeah. It's a living list. Will, the, will there be a new dip switch block that has to be bigger, or will no. you just uh, piggyback those brands onto one of the settings? In the 
So they're kind of, the question was, I don't know if you heard about, but as more brands are proofed in the lab, will we be adding more dip switches? They're really not related. To be candid, the dip switches is kind of the big crayon. You know, it's the, it's, it's the grade school crayon box where you had eight crayons, and that's, you know, you pick the color that was close enough. And, you know, you sometimes went out of the lines, but you know what, your mom still put it on the fridge. That's what the dip switches are. When we talk about the battery by model number and make that you do with the app, dip switches are ignored. Inside the app, there's actually a database that has all the parameters for those given batteries. What are their capacity? What is their voltage? What do they want to see? What CAM protocol do they use? That's all behind, and that's squirting into the regular and just overrides all the dip switches. Okay? All right. Um, and that is actually the simple and best way to configure the regulator. And that's what we're going to do after our uh, lunch break, is we're going to use wake, the wake speed app, and we're going to actually create a configuration. Just, um, yeah. There is another way, and I think there's only one person in this, well, there's two people in this room that might do this. Uh, oh, maybe three, I don't know. Uh, the hard way is, on this slide, the deep dark magic of ASCII. ASCII is a communication standard in computers that lets you, when you have the letter A, it's the way the letter A is represented. When you have the number one, it's the way the number one is represented. The wake speed regulator communicates and is configured through the USB port through a series of ASCII strings. You can download that 100-page document that will put most of you to sleep and use a text editor and create those ASCII strings and squirt it into the regular. That's the hard way to do it. The reason why that existed, and this is actually a bit of folklore, way back when, when I first did this thing like 10 years ago, a chap was going to write a cell phone app to go with my open source regulator. So I made the regulator and I said, we're going to communicate with ASCII. And there's a computer science reason for doing that because it's transportable. Everybody knows what the letter one looks like in ASCII. Everyone knows what the letter, or the number one, everyone knows what the letter A looks like in ASCII. It doesn't matter whether you're on a cell phone or an Apple or a Windows or a microcontroller, ASCII is ASCII and it's universal. Unlike if we sent a binary representation of that uh, number, this guy may treat that binary number in what's called little indent. This guy may treat it in big indent. And you have to know how each guy treats it. You have to know what the binary format is. It's complicated. Using ASCII is just a universal way to do it. That is why the wake speed regular uses ASCII to communicate. It was designed for communicating between configuration applications and the wake speed regulator in a way that was non, not prone to errors. It also happens to be human readable. So when you get guys who really want to get in the dirt, they'll get their text editor out and they'll type dollar SCT, system configure tack, colon, you know, 100. They'll type that ASCII command. As we moved forward, this guy who was going to write the cell phone app bogged on me. And I don't know how to write apps. So for the longest time, the only way you could configure the regulator was through those ASCII commands. If you go to our website, on the device tab, you can download, you saw where I showed you to download uh, little PDF files. You'll notice there's a configuration file associated with it. That's actually a pre-typed configuration file. You can see all the ASCII commands, and there's a little manual that's about 20 pages long. They'll tell you which two or three in there you might really care. It'll say, that number right there is the number you change for the alternator temperature. If you want it to be 100, you have it at 100. If you want 90, you make it 90. This number here is how you change the D rate value. You want 100%, put 0.1 in, or you put 1.0. If you want it to be 90%, you put 0.9. All those things are defined, and we have a nice little cheat manual. And my partner Rick did it because he looked at the big 100 page manual and went, yeah, no, we're not making people read that. So he made a little short manual and he highlighted the two or three that you most commonly would change. What is your battery capacity? 
What is the alternate air temperature? What are the D rate values? Those are the most common ones to change. That's the hard way to do it. But you can do it if you want to. I don't recommend you do it. To be honest, I actually use the app all the time now. I used to hand edit these things all the time. I use the app. Yes, ma'am. When did you get the app? The app's about what, two years old? Yeah. And the app is growing. At first, its focus was uh, configuration, how to create a configuration file. We've been adding features. There's monitoring functions now. You can update the firmware with it. Uh, you can do all sorts of great things with the app now. We are focusing more and more on the app. This ASCII communication, you had to use a Windows computer to transfer to the regulator. And uh, there are times with the app, if, especially if you have an iPhone, you have to use potentially a Windows computer to get to the regulator itself. But we're moving away from Windows because we're finding more and more problems with Windows. Don't know why. Um, we don't write, we, WakeSpeed, don't write any of this low-level stuff on how a Windows computer connects to the WakeSpeed regulator. It's done by ST Micro. Make your little microchip in here. Drivers are getting installed incorrectly. We've had customers who've had computers have been working. Something happened last August. I had about a half a dozen customers come in and say, hey, how come my lab computer doesn't work anymore? We all know. Microsoft pushed out an update, and all of a sudden those machines didn't work. We'll have a little hints on trying to get around that. But more and more, we're, 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 all of our development efforts is on the app. Yes, ma'am? Are there any plans to um, make the app work for Mac OS? Not for Mac OS, no. I thought you were going to ask another question. But uh, I will tell you definitively, no, not for Mac OS. Uh, question, so it talks, I guess, how does the configuration get from your iPhone or mobile device to Wakespeed? Is it via Bluetooth? So this is the question I thought she was going to ask. So um, today, if you have an Android phone, and, um, and we're definitely, there's slides on this, but we're going to talk about it now. If you have an Android phone, you use what's called an on-the-go cable. They're like two bucks. They're like seven bucks at Amazon and two bucks at Alibaba. You plug this into your phone, and this end looks like just a standard USB cable. You then plug this in to the adapter, the on-the-go adapter. This is really important. It changes the behavior of the Android device. It's not just changing the connectors. There's actually something in here that causes the Android device to become a master as opposed to a, a slave device. You have to use the OTG cable. And then you plug this into the WakeSpeed regular. And that does two things. It provides power to the logic side, so you can do this on your desk, right? You don't have to have it installed. And it'll also allow communication down to it. If you're using an Apple device, uh, Apple said, you're not an Apple device. There's no way you're plugging something into our phone. So you can't do it with an Apple device. You have to create the configuration file and then email it to a Windows computer to send it down or an Android device. Um, I will answer the question that you kind of implied. Wow, that sounds all great and fine, but everything's better with Bluetooth. Why do I have to use this cable? Um, I cannot talk about future products. I will tell you that a wireless communication is one of the highest requested features uh, to expand on the wake speed. And that's I'm looking at the attorney here. That's probably all I can say. <laughs> okay? All right. Um, let's go ahead and just do a couple more slides here. Uh, here we are. The very simplest way to do it. RVC. Uh, you set it up. Do you remember I talked about instances on, on RVC? On, on the instances, there are instances for the battery. And when you plug in and use just connected, you know, plug and go, dip switches one and two let you define the instance. RVC recognizes that you might have a house battery and a starter battery and maybe a generator battery. And all of those batteries can live on the RVC network. So when you send information out or listen for information, you have to match the instance. If you're just going to do this, Super simple way, you just plug it in, you'll have to set the dip switches. By and large, dip switch one and two will be off. That's the default, that means house batteries. But if you get a situation where you have a complex install with multiple 
batteries that you have multiple regulators trying to talk to. That's how you adjust that with the dip switches. Realistically, if you're in that type of environment, you're probably going to the cell phone app, you know, to the app and creating. Okay. Um, I already mentioned the RVC spec you can download from here. Uh, Kin to the 2000 richer, large number, blah, 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 all this stuff we've covered. Um, key walk away is that is what the wake speed is based on. Even when we bring in these alternative programs, alternative protocols like SMA and Lux and the Victron links and you know, MG Energy, all that stuff, we actually translate those into RVC messages. So the wake speed thinks he's always talking to, a wake, to an RVC battery, even though we bring in uh, different CAM protocols. Okay. <clears throat> Dip switches, here we go. Uh, again, one and two is the battery instance. This is used for reporting. Here's the battery type. Uh, this is the one right here that I was talking about. Dips three, three, four, and five. It's now Battleborn. It's a drop-in lithium battery, and we'll talk about how that works and, and, and why we feel comfortable with it uh, later. But um, that's the one that's changed. The older one, that is where the Firefly was at. And it's not there anymore. That's the one you want to be aware of. Uh, seven and eight define your battery capacity. So uh, this is how that works. You can define them in 250 amp hour steps. Doesn't matter the voltage. This is the amp hour capacity of the battery. So 24 volt battery, if it's a 200 amp hour battery at 24 volts, you're going to do this. If it's a 500 amp hour battery at 24 volts, you're going to pick one of these two. You're not going to like divide it in half because it's 24 volts. It's what is the amp hour capacity of the battery. Then uh, we already talked about small out mode. Okay. Hopefully this is a review. This was meant to be the deep dive, but we've covered all this information already. Is there any questions on this on the dip switches? Yes, sir. Uh, you said it used to be the Firefly. Yes. So if I didn't do a firmware update, would I still have the Firefly? In my... Yes. I think version 2.5.0 is when we made this change. And what you can do, speaking of versions, that 100-page document I keep referring to, so our marketing department will do a little release note and a blurb when we have firmware update. If you want to know what the details are, it's documented in the first page of that 100-page document. Whenever we do a firmware update, we release a companion to that 100-page document. We'll have a change log in the beginning, and we also will highlight in that document things that have changed, usually with the color red. So you can scan through quickly. If you're the guy that has spent the time to read that whole bloody thing, you can scan through pretty quickly and see where the changes are. Okay. Uh, the easiest way to do it, and this is what I'm going to recommend, I am absolutely going to recommend, personally, if you're putting in golf cart batteries, you know, two or four of them, do a dip switches and get on with life if you're happy with the alternator. If you want to get more refined and take, you know, more, more customized and optimized, then you'll do the app. The reason why is, remember we said lead acid batteries are pretty forgiving. So those dip switches saying you're somewhere between 250, 500 amp hours. Well, you know what, when we make that tail current decision, we'll be in the ballpark. We'll probably be okay. If you're doing a lithium ion battery, you can do the dip switches, but I'd recommend not. I'd recommend going to this because we want to be more precise. Then the other aspect that you'll definitely want to drive to this is if you want to change parameters on your alternator or any other advanced features. So, from my perspective, I would use today one of two ways. Very simple, afternoon work, let, you know, a couple of Trojans, you can get away with the dip switches. Anything else, just use the app. It only takes about five minutes, and you'll have something that's optimized and customized and a perfect fit for that particular, that particular solution. Okay? Um, on the app, and I'm coming over here to look to see, yeah. Uh, so on the app, we allow you to configure, update, monitor, and do diagnostics with your wake speed. Some of this requires connection to the actual regulator itself, but you can create configurations on either the, app, the iPhone or the Android version. When you're connected to the wake speed, you can transfer that configuration down. You can update the firmware. There's a monitor page where you can see dials and gauges, so real quick check out. You can turn on what's called expert mode that unlocks other features. 
that you can see. So for example, that dial engages, in addition to seeing what the battery voltage and current is, you can see what is the current goals and limits. So that's a quick way for you to really diagnose what's going on. You can take a log file, and that is a running list of these ASCII uh, strings. And that is something you can go back to later, study that 100 page manual, specifically one section on AST, and you can see a trend. You can see what the regulator is doing over time. You can see it starting up. You can see when it's getting connection from the CAN BMS. You can see where the BMS is asking for this or not asking for this. You can see where the regulator might be standalone and has gone from bulk to absorption to float. You can see all those transitions over time. You can see how the alternator is going to heat up. A lot of this kind of stuff, and assuming we have time at the end of the day, I'm going to give some hints on this. Because when you're doing troubleshooting, this is like the advanced troubleshooting. You don't want to just know what's going on now. You want to see what's happening over time. You'd be amazed what you can learn by looking at trends over time through these ASCII logs. Okay? We're going to break for lunch now. When we come back, we're going to do three things. The first thing we're going to do is go create a configuration for that system back there. And at some time, we're going to go back and do a live spin and configure regulation, uh, configure it and see it work. We're also going to talk about how to approach bring up and diagnostics. And then we're going to talk about some more advanced ways to use some of these tools we've been talking about and ways that we have found successful to approach. So um, I think that point. All right. So what we're going to do now is talk more about the wake speed regulator and the gory details of how you configure it. A lot of the stuff we already kind of alluded to, the book, this is this document, 100 pages. It gets updated with every version of firmware that comes out. You'll be able to see what the changes are in that particular firmware at a, at a high level. We don't put all the gory details in, but you know, we put 20 or 30. We put the stuff you need to know, right? There is documentation on the pinouts. Like, for example, this is the actual pinout of that RJ45 jack. That's in this document. There are sections on about how you send data to the regulator, how you send it from the regulator. I made mention of the log files. There's this command, there's this status AST, alternator status, comes out once a second. When you capture a log file, it's going to be a whole bunch of AST lines with our stuff sprinkled in. You can capture that, pull it out, email it to your computer, open it up and, and study it. And this is the decoder ring, okay? The uh, other purpose of this is all the fault codes. So we've got user guides that have a summary of fault codes, but all of the gory details and every single one of them is listed in here. I just go straight to this document. We, for the user guide, we kind of cherry pick the ones you're most likely to get. You go to this, when we add new faults, they'll be documented in here. We also have uh, the third party uh, connections that we use in terms of, um, I'm sorry, we also, this is a document that really, there's only, well now I can see there's only one person in this room that should truly have to study it, because the error guy's gone. <laughs> this is, remember I talked about how this ASCII communication is a con common computer science way for different entities to talk with each other. In addition to the wake speed app, there are other third party products that I want to make mention of. That's what this last bullet line is here. We have got a company, one of our partners, Off Grid Storage Solutions. They have made an application that you run on a Windows computer. Um, I think they may have done an Apple or maybe not. They were talking about it. You run on a Windows computer, you can, you can hook it up to the uh, wake speed regulator and it'll capture information, show graphs, and it'll let you enter these commands. That's a third party product. Uh, one of our other partners, Ocean Planet Energy, if you, any of you know Nigel or, or Bruce, um, they are part of Ocean Planet Energy. They've created a standalone product called a Tether that is kind of akin to a servo in the sense that it lives on the CAN network. It can receive and send information to the wake speed regulator and present it on a third, you know, over, over a, a wide area connection. So in addition to you guys using this document to really understand what's going on inside the regulator, it's also used by third parties when they're doing uh, value add offerings to, to the product. Okay. ASCII configuration. We finally get to it. This is an example of ASCII commands. 
system config alternator, 100 degrees C, 90%, 75%, 50%, 30 seconds engine warm up delay. I know what that means because I've lived this for years and years. If you want to know what that means, you're going to go to that 100 page document and look up what SCA means. Same SCT. How many poles? What's the drive ratio? This is how you calibrate it. Uh, charge profile alternator, overdrive, float. This is how you define the charge profile for the wake, in the wake speed regulator if the wake speed is going to drive the charge. So if the wake speed is the master, if the uh, blinky lights are green, that's what's going to be followed. If the wake speed is a slave, that's going to be ignored. There are a couple of exceptions, and this is something for you to write down. There are a couple of exceptions where the wakes will actually override what the battery tells us to do. We kind of double check stuff, and that's on this line, uh, charge profile battery. So in here, you define temperature limits, you define the C rate. We also have the ability as you're reaching the extremes to do a reduced C rate. This particular thing, and I'm just going to tell you, it will stop charging above 45 degrees C and below 5 degrees C just won't charge. I don't care if the BMS is asking for it. We will not honor that and we'll override it. It's a double check. If you don't want the regulator doing that, you just put zeros in for those parameters or minus ones. It, everyone's a little bit different. You can define it. I will also tell you this is set up for a 0.5 C rate. So we're going to limit battery current to that battery at a 0.5 C rate unless we get a temperature extremes. If we're from 42 to 45 degrees C, We're going to run this at a 0.05 C rate. It's a way for the regulator to, as the battery starts getting stressed, will slow things down. Now, we purposely had a choice to either leave that line active or to have it also ignored when we're in a slave mode. We chose to leave it active because sometimes systems installers may say, I don't care if the battery is rated for a 0.5 C rate and wants a 0.5 C. I don't care if the battery is asking for a 1 C. Do you guys know what I mean when I say C rate? No. Okay. I saw a lot of deer in the headlight stares, and I didn't know if it was because of lunch. Um, batteries, they define things. <laughs> no, I was starting to get the look like my wife gives me when I'm explaining things to her. It's like, oh, that's nice, dear. Uh, batteries, one of the ways that they describe batteries is what they call C rates. And it's a ratio of how many amps you can take out of a battery or put into a battery. There's a discharge C rate and a charge C rate based on the battery capacity. If you have a one C rate battery and a 400 amp hour battery, you can stuff 400 amps into it at a time. If you have a battery that's spec'd at 0.5 C rate, that 400 amp hour battery, you can stuff 200 amps into it at a time. So C rate, C rate is a, a battery industry terminology used to describe how quickly you can charge or discharge a battery defined in terms of its overall capacity. Does that make sense? Okay. Very common C rate for lithium batteries, 0.5 C. Very common. We're having newer batteries coming in where they're doing bare thermal management. They'll do a 1 C rate. We have uh, Lifeline batteries. I think they'll do a 1 C rate or even a 2 C rate. I mean, they'll take a ton. We have Lead acid batteries, the typical battery, believe it or not, the rule of thumb is 25% of capacity. That's from sailors. If you actually look at the batteries themselves, most of them are defined as a, a 10%, a 0.1 C rate. So every battery manufacturer and every battery chemistry has a different C rate. What we have done here is we have the ability to say, when these batteries are getting stressed, they're reaching their upper or lower limits, we can do it also if they're highly discharged, we'll take it gentle on the battery. Even if the battery asks for more, we'll take it gentle. And we did that because sometimes uh, customers, when they design their system, they just don't want to put the battery to its limit. They want to take it more gentle on the battery, just like you can define a lower temperature point on the alternator or a lower uh, maximum field drive on the alternator. That's how you can do that. Other times customers may say, The battery may be able to take 400 amps, but the rest of my wiring can only take 200 amps. So that's kind of why we left that active. All right. This is the gory details. If you're the guy that wants to get the text editor and edit it, that's how you create a configuration file. 
This is what the weight speed application creates, and this is what gets squirted down into the regulator uh, when you actually configure it. Yes, sir? Well, how would you make a typo? Does it just break the device, or does it just give you a <clears throat> It's a very good question. Uh, there is very limited range checking on every one of those parameters. If you make a typo and the parameter is out of sequence, you may end up with a misconfigured regulator. If you make a typo in the range, we, we basically on every parameter will do a range check. And that's documented in the ASCII comms guide. If you're outside of that range, then the regulator will throw a knack. It's every, like a 9999 C rate. It won't just like yeah. set my batteries on fire. Exactly. Yeah, there's limits to that, but it's not absolute. Uh, really, you gotta be careful with this stuff. You gotta be careful you don't mess it up. Um, Typically, if you provide a short string, the regulator will accept it because when we add new parameters, we put it on the end. So if you send the short string in, the regulator will accept it. You may have dropped the parameter in the middle and everything shifted over. It's fiddly. You have to be careful. You have to be very, very careful when you do this. All right. So I'm only showing this to you to explain how the product actually works. And I also want to point out one more thing. All of those charge profile, you may have heard me a couple of times talk about expert mode in the app. Normally you can't change that. You select the battery and it's all driven by tables and that's what you get because we programmed it in for you. You can turn on expert mode and you can go in and mess with these numbers. And you're welcome to do it. You're going to get a little pop-up that says if Rome burns, it's on you, right? Uh, but you can do that. Here's the thing you need to know. As far as the wake speed regulator is concerned, the only battery that exists in the whole world is a 12 volt, 500 amp hour battery. That's it. There's no 48 volt, there's no 2000 amp hour batteries. They don't exist, a 12 volt, 500 amp hour battery. Now we get to those R voltages in runtime because we apply multipliers. So if you're in a 48 volt environment, all of these numbers you define here will get multiplied by four. So like if we are a 24 volt battery, we would actually charge toward 28.4 volts if we apply 2.0. Same with battery capacity. It's by the way why you can support a 32 volt vessel because the multiplier is 2.333 I think. So you can apply these multipliers and it makes it a very flexible product. But you have to know whenever you're working at the expert level, either doing it the hard way by editing these or in the app with expert toggle on, all of these numbers are defined as a 24 volt, uh, sorry, a 12 volt, 500 amp hour battery. So for example, this number right here, 250, that is defined as max battery current. 250 is half of 500, 0.5. That's how you make a 0.5 C rate. That's how you define it in here. So, just I want you to know that. Uh, if you do go down that path, hopefully you'll remember, oh yeah, and it's documented in the document, but just remember that's a very important detail if you go into the expert mode on the wake speed app. All right. Once you have a configuration file, there's a couple of ways to get it into the regulator. The old way is you would take that text file, and you can still do it today, we have a Windows transfer tool. You download the Windows transfer tool from the WakeSpeed website, unzip it, connect your Windows computer up to the WakeSpeed regulator. You drop that text file into the tool. You run the, the update.bat file, and it will guide you through to update the regulator. We also do the same thing for firmware updates as well, based on Windows computer. So if you've got an Apple phone, Apple device, and you're trying to create a configuration, this is one way you can get it into the wake speed regulator. And a little side note, yes, I had to go to the mat and explain to Apple why I made reference to a Windows computer associated with an iPhone app. They didn't like that. The other way that you can get from an iPhone into a wake speed regulator is to email it to an Android device and you can import that configuration into your Android device. And then you can connect it directly and you can transfer the configuration down. And yes, I had to go to that. 
because Apple didn't like the fact that I was mentioning Android in their iPhone app. So there are a couple of ways you can do that. We have video files. There are video learn files on how to do all of this stuff on the Wakespeed website. Do this if you have to. I'm just going to tell you, try not to do it. Don't try, we are moving away from Windows just because it's been problematic as of late. We still support it. There may be a time sometime soon when we actually pull all the Windows tools just because it's becoming more and more problematic. So anyway, what we're going to focus on now is the way that I suggest you create a Wakespeed application. There are within the app, and why don't you guys work with me, all of you open the Wakespeed app. Now I'm going to swipe to open and get mine open here. If I can find it. Okay. So it'll come up and uh, then what you'll get is if you click on this little slide, this little home thing on the top left corner, you get this slide out. And what I want you to do is go and select the configuration. You see here we've got configuration, we've got monitor, we've got logging, we've got all the stuff, but we're going to focus on the configuration tab. So you should have a screen that looks something like this. On this screen, you define your alternator, your battery, things about the system, whether you have a shunt installed, is it backwards. You can select the BMS if there happens to be multiple BMSs. And if you want to do any of the engine stuff with the white space, you can go to that tab. That's how we've broken it down. We are going to go through right now, and I do need to get this phone here. I want to go through and create the configuration for that system that's in the back. So what I want you to do on this very first screen, and we always start with the first because that kind of, it tells us, it tells us what our voltage is going to be, to be frank. That's how we know whether we're dealing with a 12 or 24 volt system or 48. So we start with the alternator. So we have got a Lee Snowville Presto light. So on the very first drop down where it says brand, Drop that down and pick Lee Snowville Presto Light. And I'm all but positive you guys can't see this, but should look something like this now. Then on model, I want you to do the drop down menu and the very last one, AVI 160. Pick that guy. Okay. The next thing that you will want to probably edit, and you'll notice this has got a little note here when you pick that, alt that alternator. It says, oh, you have to use a certain part number to convert that alternator for external regulation. So a lot of the stuff, a little note will pop up to give you hints. That's actually a, you can talk to Rick. He's got the magic decoder. This is actually really exciting. This is a modern alternator with a factory conversion kit if you can get that part number. So talk to Rick and figure out how to do it because I'm personally really excited about that. Then the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to change the name. This is what's going to show up on your NEMA 2000 display. So let's just change this and call it main. So go ahead and erase where it says wake speed and change it to something ca called uh, main. Whatever you want to do. You know, when you do your real install, you might say port, you might say starboard. It's really not relevant to how the regulator works. It's only relative to this is what's going to show up on the NEMA 2000 displays. This is what's going to show up on the servo. Okay. And then, once you're done here, we're not going to go ahead and hook up stator wires. We're not going to do anything for RPM. We're just going to make a simple install. So go ahead and press next or save configuration. Okay. Move on to the battery screen. And what I want you to do is pick Victron, because we've got Victron. And the battery that we're going to use is called, on the next one down, pick BAT 
4121 01084. BAT 4121 10 BAT 4121 01084. Yep, pick that one. Boy. I love Victron. I always have to remember they're Dutch. <laughs> 4121. 4121. 0184. Okay. I should have done this before. So I'll just pick this guy here, okay? Um, you will then see and tight, and we just have one battery. Okay, in this example, if you had two or three or four, you'd type the number of those batteries you have. In this case, we have one. You're going to see a little bit of information. You're going to see a little picture here that kind of shows you how these batteries are going to be wired. And you're going to see a little summary. You have a battery bank, 12 volt at uh, 110 amp hours. That's how big your system is. So because you've defined the voltage already, this little picture will decide if you're going to put them all in parallel or serials or a combination. It'll also indicate, it'll throw some of these boxes as red. Uh, if you pick the 24 volt system and you said he had five of these, it would say, I didn't know what to do with the fifth one. So it's, it's just kind of a quick, cute uh, check. Then the very next thing that we want to look at is down here in this gray, this is how this battery is going to be charged. It's a summary. This is what the charge profile that's built in to the wake speed app, the database, that's what Victron has told us how we should charge that battery. So you can kind of see this, and there's ways to change it, we'll talk about later, but this is what comes from the factory. That's it. So we've picked the alternator tab, we said the make and model, we changed the name, we picked the battery tab, we picked the make and model, we said how many. Now we're going to go to the system tab. We, yes, we're going to install a current shunt. It is a 500 amp, 50 millivolt shunt. And no, it's not in backwards. We added this little toggle switch here is the shunt in backwards in case you get the gray and purple wire backwards. And the way you'll know that is during your checkout, you'll do the monitor tab. And if the battery current shows up as negative when you're charging it or positive when you're discharging it, you can either crawl down into the engine room and move those wires around or just toggle this toggle. Your choice, I'll leave it up to you, okay? Go ahead and save the, at this point on the engine tab, we're not going to do anything because frankly, we're not talking to an engine as a test tank. We aren't going to do anything. So let's go ahead and go ahead and save configuration. And then I am going to show, I'm going to take my on the go cable, OTG. When you go to Amazon, you're going to search for OTG adapter. OTG USB, there, it has this big specification. One of the chapters in it is OTG. This is a special cable. It changes the behavior of the device you plug it into. You can't just get something that changes this connector or this connector. It must have the words, the letters, OTG, all in caps. They're like four bucks on Amazon. They're like a buck fifty at Alibaba, or you can get them from Dragonfly Energy for like 20. Your choice. Uh, but they're readily available. Just get one that plugs into your phone. Then you're going to take a common USB cable. Actually, this is known uh, as a printer cable. They're very often used on the printer cables, the Type B, the big robust one. If you have one of the prior versions of the wake speed, you need the little micro. Be really careful when you plug it in because if you twist this thing off, it's not covered by warranty. <laughs> All right, so we'll go ahead and plug my USB cable into the bottom. And then I'm going to plug this into here. You'll notice a little symbol. You probably, you couldn't notice it, but on the far left side, there are the three dots. That's the stack menu. Right next to it is a little USB trident showed up. I'll go ahead and then plug it. I don't know if you guys have good enough eyes to see this. Some of you do. Yay. I know I don't. Um, but it goes away. When you plug it in, and the, wakes, and the app recognizes that there's something plugged in, that little symbol will show up. 
Down the road, that symbol may change to another symbol depending on what's going on. But this means that we're talking to the regulator, and you will notice that the LED is blinking. It's blinking green. At this point in time, what I can do is pick this stack bars, and I can pick uh, configured device. Looks like I waited too long. I have to press the reset button. It didn't, I didn't have my little symbol there, and that was grayed out. So I pressed the reset button, and now it's not grayed out anymore. It says configure device. So now it's sending that configuration to the regulator. And we wait, and we wait, and we're done. That's it. We've now configured the regulator. So if I wanted to do this quickly without talking, I'll go ahead and do it. I'm going to do new on this app. I'm going to pick the alternator. I know it's uh, Lee Neville. I know the brand is this AVR. I'll just leave it as the name is Altreg. Next, battery. It's a uh, Victron. The model number is one of these guys down here. I'm not going to waste time looking for it. And I've only got one. Next tab. System, yeah, I got to shine at the battery. Go ahead and save it. It's already saved already. It's saying this, y'all yeah, go ahead and override it. You might, you can save it as different names, depending on your vessel you're doing install. I plug it in. You might get this pop-up, by the way, because sometimes the, this is Android saying, do you want to let this device use that connection? The answer is yes. So I plug it in, and it looks like Android's not happy. So I'll go ahead and unplug it, replug it. I hate stuff that we didn't write that we have to depend on. Oh, my Lord. It worked the first time. So I'm going to go in and press the reset button. Ah, look, that worked. Sometimes that works better than plugging in a knot. I'll go ahead and pick the bars and squirt it down. Uh, configure device, and aside from my little editorial comments about the pop-ups that happened and having to press the reset button, you can see this literally took 30 seconds to create a configuration. And it ain't going to matter if this is a simple lead acid battery or if it's a high connected BMS battery. It's going to take the same amount of time for basic configurations. This is the way to configure your white speed regulator. So with this, we're going to break now. We're going to go into the back room, and we're going to use one of you guys who made this configuration. We're going to squirt it in to the regulator and do a live test, and we're going to play with some of these other screens as the monitoring, the logging, and then we'll come back in and talk more detail about each of those screens. All righty, folks. I had to get the thumbs up from the back there. Um, we've actually covered a lot of what the app can do. Um, at some point in time, you'll be able to sit down and do a lot of this stuff with an Android phone. You can do a lot of the configuration phone with the iPhone, and we're going to cover more and more of the details of it. Just play with it, and I hope you can understand why we're focusing more and more on the app. Everything we did in there, you can do with a Windows computer. You can do everything we did in there with the exception of updating firmware with an Apple computer. You just need a terminal program. All you CS guys, you just need term. That's all you need. You can cut and paste those text files into a terminal program. You'll get the A-OK -okay if it's accepted, and you'll get a knack if it isn't. You guys will know what I'm talking about. Who care? It's just so much easier with the app, right? All right, so what I want to do now is just go over some of these things that we've already done a little bit. Uh, the alternator tab, why don't you go ahead and get all of your phones up again. And what I want you to do is go and um, go to the settings page and turn on expert mode. Now go back to the configure and go to the alternator tab. And you'll see there are rose-colored features that are unlocked. You can change some parameters now. You can change all the parameters. You're an expert. If you're going to change these, be an expert. Go and download that 100-page document 
and read what all these commands do so you understand what happens. Because, like for example, go ahead and click on this thing that says alternate air capacity. We get this a lot. People turn on expert mode and they say, oh, I've got a 185 amp alternator. What does it say in red under that? Uncommon to use. <laughs> you want to take a bet how many support calls get to me where somebody has entered that and they said, well, yeah, it's a 180 amp alternator. And I asked, did you read that note? They don't. And I've actually, this is probably the number one issue where people go sideways in the app is they'll air alternator capacity. The wake speed technology started as a DC generator. As a DC generator, there's a reason for us to know how many amps the alternator can do. In this environment, we don't. It's very uncommon usage. I've actually toyed with taking that out because we have issues. However, there are certain really gnarly cases where this has been helpful. So I'm a bit on the fence with it, but I'm just going to tell you guys, RTFA, read the friggin' app. When it says uncommon use, do not put something here. Don't put something there. All right, so we'll carry on here, since I've belabored that a bit. We just won't define anything. Uh, you'll notice down here, also in the rose-colored stuff, I can set the password. This doesn't mean anything today, because today we have no need to have a password if you're trying to connect this device to this device today. But who knows, maybe in the future that password will be important. Um, there is actually a use for that password, I will tell you though. You have an ability as an expert on the system tab to lock this regulator down, to say, I don't want anybody making changes. And you can lock it down in such a way that you have to reset the regulator and issue the password. That's the value that you may choose to use to keep your customers from futzing with stuff that you spend a lot of time doing. I'll tell you another thing, that password comes out in the normal ASCII commands or in the normal ASCII status. If you take a log file, you'll see the password there, unless you put a dot in front of that name. Then that will be suppressed. All right, we've been a day and a half. I want to see who's been paying attention. I just gave you a very valuable piece of information. If I wasn't here, where would you go to learn that putting a dot in front of that password would suppress it on output? The app or the 100 Does it say it in the app? No. All right. Where would you go? The website. The 100 page manual. He said he just didn't want to say it again. <laughs> He's like, oh damn, he didn't take my answer. I must have said something right. No, you said something right. You just gave me two answers. One was correct and one wasn't. Everything in rose color, you're an expert. You got to read that manual. Now, you don't have to read the whole thing, but you're going to have to read it enough to understand where to look for it. And I'm just going to tell you, there's a command called uh, NCP, name, password, config. You'll go find that section and it'll say, Here's the name, and there's limits on what you can do. It'll tell you how long it is. Here's the password, and it's going to say, if you put a zero, a dot in front of it, it'll be suppressed. That's where you're going to go get that answer. I am overemphasizing this. The number one problem when a support call gets to me is people have gone into bloody expert mode and hosed things up. And I just play silly. I just say, I'm kind of slow. We're going to take it all over. I have them create a new configuration from the very beginning, just like we did an hour ago. It, takes 30, it actually takes about 45 seconds because I have to ask them some questions. We make a new configuration, a simple one. We squirt into the regulator and, oh, by golly, it's working now. So I'll get off that particular hobby horse a bit. All right, the other thing we can do, you'll notice this alternator you can set the alternator temperature. And in this case, it's 110 degrees C. But you notice how it's in rose color? That's because when we got the information from Lee Neville on this alternator, 
they told us they wanted to run at 110. So normally, we don't even give you an option. We don't even ask you that. Why should you care? We, WakeSpeed, have already done the work for you. We contacted the manufacturer. They told us 110, and we put it in there. If you had picked an alternator that was a generic one, that wasn't by name, you'd have to enter that, in, you'd be able to enter that information yourself, and you'd have to do it. But that's kind of the difference. So sometimes some of these parameters just show up in the regular mode, and sometimes they'll be hidden, and that's why. Um, the next one, and we're going to go through every one of these, by the way, because this is all helpful information. The next one is repurpose the battery temperature as a secondary alternator temperature sensor. This actually is helpful when you've got two alternators on one engine. And remember, on our harnesses, we have got a battery temperature sensor and an alternator temperature sensor. Now, if we happen to have a CAN-connected battery, and the battery's already telling us the battery temperature, this one's not used. It's not needed. You can tell the regulator, use this as a second alternator temperature sensor. So if you've got two alternators, and we've seen that in a lot of those Nordhavens, two identical alternators on the same engine, you would toggle that on, you'd put another little short temperature sensor, you put this on one alternator and this one on the other one, and what the wake speed to do is it'll pick the hottest. And that's how it'll manage the alternator temperature. So that's kind of a neat little feature that you can do. Uh, small out mode, <clears throat> this is just like turning on dip switch eight. If you don't have a regular without dip switch eight, it's just like turning dip switch eight on. Um, adjust max field drive. Oh, ho, ho, ho. This is the live rail of alternator regulators. As you remember, we talked about field wire, uh, the uh, stator wire and the tachometer dropping out because you weren't driving it. Go ahead and toggle that button that says adjust max. Uh, that, uh, oh, I'm sorry. This is max field drive. Oh, that's okay. I got ahead of myself, sorry. Uh, adjust max field drive. Go ahead and toggle that on. And you can see here, for this alternator, we do 100%, 75%, and 50%. That is normal, small out mode, and half power mode by default. You can change those any things you want. Often when I do an install, I'll drive alternators to 90%, just to be a little more gentle on them. But alternator manufacturers don't like us being gentle on their alternator. They want to see their alternator outperform other ones. So that's why we do 100%. So that is actually something that you might want to consider adjusting in your own, own respect. <clears throat> I will tell you another little detailed hint. We have the ability, this is super advanced capabilities, but you'll see this used in some of our configurations. The white feature in has the ability to select uh, half power mode. Do you remember me talking about that? If you put 0% in for half power mode, that will tell the regulator to go into standby. It's a way to turn the regulator off without turning it off. And the areas where we've seen this done, we have one battery where we receive proprietary battery information. We translate it into RVC and present that for the whole world to use. Well, they want to see that translation happen all the time, not just when the engine's running. So in that install, what they did is they connected the brown wire to the 12 volt power source. So the wake speed's always active, 724. Then they connected the white wire to the key switch. And when the key switch, and they actually selected as inverted. So when you apply power, if no power's here, the regular will be in half power mode, 0%, standby. When you apply power here, will be released from half power mode and we'll go into normal mode. There's a little bit of thinking there in logic, but it shows some of the flexibility and things you can do with the wake speed. We have the ability to drive DC to DC converters, sometimes that's used that way. Anytime you have a need to run the regulator for some reason other than driving an alternator all the time, this is a technique you can use to make sure the regulator knows when the engine's actually running or not. It's a rather esoteric use, but I'm sure you guys, if you ever have a need to do it, you might, hopefully you'll remember this and go, what was it he said? Um, <laughs> all right, um, use RPMs to sense the stator wire. This is a uh, normal thing. If you toggle that on, two things are gonna happen. It's gonna ask you whether you wanna calibrate the WS500, and this is where 
you get to put in things such as the number of poles and the poly ratio. It also opens up this uh, thing called minimum field drive. And you'll notice right now that's in white. We're moving that to expert mode. That's, a that's the thing that's hazardous. This is what I was starting to go down my rant on, where the tachometer dies. Right now you'll notice it says zero. So that means it'll let the regulator go all the way to zero percent. If we have to shut the alternator off, we'll shut it off. However, if you have a customer that wants to keep their tack wire live, you might put 1% or 2% here. So we won't shut the alternator all the way off, we'll shut it sort of off. Please only use that with lead acid batteries. You can fine tune stuff with lithium, but it is super dodgy and super risky. Just tell customers, sorry, that's the nature of the beast and find another solution for your tachometer. Move the tack wire to the ship's alternator, get a physical alternator, get a tiny tack, get something that you know, senses off the, the uh, flywheel, whatever it is, find another solution. Um, adaptive idle pullback. This was something that we're probably, probably going to depreciate in the uh, regulator. This was an early attempt at white space, but it only focused on the low end side. White space is a much rarer way to do it, so this one I'm just going to tell you ignore. Um, Use RPMs to select half power. Who made the question about what happens if the engine stops running? That was you. This is how you could do that. You would do that by two things. One, hopefully you're getting RPMs in a stable way. You would say, you know what? If this engine is ever under 100 RPMs, it's probably not running. So you type 100 here, and then you go up to your half power, and you type zero in. So guess what? If the regulator ever senses that the engine RPMs are below 100 RPMs, we'll go into standby mode. That is how you would deliver that value. Not only helpful on situations where you have a failure in the engine, but these vans that have the auto start stop at traffic lights, that's how we solve the issue. That when the engine has stopped at the traffic light, we don't end up burning up the alternator. I'm going to pause for a little bit and see if that clicks with some people. I'm not seeing nods. Okay, if you want to learn more about how to do that, I'll be happy. We're really covering the de details. Hopefully this stuff's going to be on video um, and, and you can kind of go into it more details. So if we go to the battery, you'll see uh, the battery that you selected. If we scroll down, there's a new thing in the rose color that says adjust battery profiles. And this one, when you toggle it on, you're going to get the roam is going to burn. And when it burns, it's your fault. So click and say OK. And you remember all those commands of CPA and CPO and CPF and CPB? Let's go ahead and twist open that CPB. And we can see the max bad amps that's been defined for this. We can see parameters such as the high temperature, the low temperature. It's a lead acid, so the uh, temperature compensation's in here. He can go through and change every single parameter as you want to in this particular place, okay? If we go on to the systems, um, boy, I tell you what, there's a whole bunch of rose-colored stuff in systems. I'm not gonna go over one, but I'll just give a summary. Advanced options, this is some of that reliability stuff. So do you want to require there to be a CAN connected? And if BMS, and if it's not there, what do you want the regulator to do? Do you want it to go into a degraded mode or do you want it to go into a fault mode? Every one of these has got a default behavior and you can override it through a hard fault. Where would you go to find the default behaviors for this expert feature? Yes, exactly. Thank you. Um, we also have an area, and this is actually kind of interesting, we have this area called ignore sensors. And sometimes you aren't hooking the sensor up. Sometimes you're not hooking up the current shunt because you're getting it from the battery. Sometimes you're not hooking up the stator wire. And what you can do is you can declare to ignore those sensors and that will prevent any random information from sneaking in and causing mischief inside the regulator. 
Normally those things are largely set automatically. For example, if you want on the alternator tab and I said I don't care to uh, sense RPMs, we will automatically ignore the stator wire. If you're on a CAN connected BMS, and we know it's going to be CAN connected BMS, we will say ignore the battery temperature, I'm sorry, ignore the uh, current shunt. And we may even say ignore the battery temperature sensor, depending on what the capability is that's coming in. So a lot of that stuff's set automatically, but this is where you can go and verify them if you need to. We have a lot of other type of features. Oh, look at here where it says select system lockout option. And you can go and see the SCO command and you can say prevent changes uh, to the wake speed regulator unless you issue a reset command with the password. So it's worth mentioning that in the CAN options, that's where you can uh, be an expert on You can change the VOD. Correct. Yeah, we'll get down to there. All right. So now we're moving down on the regular options. Remember I talked about instances? This is where you define the regular instance. You got a twin engine that's going to be instance one and two. Now, truth be told, the wake speeds, because they know about each other, they're brothers, they, if they see two regulators with the same instance, they'll automatically bump it. So reality is you don't have to worry about it. But if you have a very specific reason for knowing that the port is one and the starboard's two, you can explicitly declare them this way if you want to. Otherwise, they'll just automatically pick one and they'll stay that way. Um, how should the feature in wire behave? So this is uh, different options that the feature and wire can do. Again, go to the Bible to figure out what they do. Uh, auto, uh, how should the feature out wire behave? Should it be um, act as a uh, just solid light if there's an error? Should it use, we can use this to indicate a diesel generator to start running because the battery wants charging. We can actually use it to enable a heater. Uh, we know when the battery is too cold and if you want to enable a heater, that's another thing it can do. Uh, engine warm-up delay, that's at 30 seconds. You can make it as small as 15 or make it larger if you want to. Uh, engine ID, this is another one of those instances. If you got a port in the starboard, you're going to have to look at the instance ID to associate the regular with each one. Go to the Bible. There is a difference between instances on RVC and NEMA 2000. One of them starts the numbers at zero. The other one starts the numbers at one. So in, it's actually an RVC, it's J 1939. It's going to be zero and one for J 1939. And for NEMA 2000, it's going to be one and two. You're entering numbers here and it's documented in our, our manual as J 1939 instances. But no, when you set up those NEMA 2000 gateways, you're going to set it up as one and two. And that's all commented in the, uh, some of the details. Can controller options. Again, instances for the batteries, right? We have got, do you want to enable RVC? Remember we talked about that, you could disable it if you want to. This is where you can do the uh, CAN baud rate. So you can select the baud rate if you're going to use something different than what is normal and standard. Um, this second to the last one, different CAN protocols. This is where all of the different CAN, alternative CAN protocols that we support that are documented. Are listed. So you can see we support SMA, we support Victron VE CAN, that would be example of the links. Uh, also that's the MG Energy. We just support the Discover batteries, we support uh, Lithium Vox, we also support Lux. I mean you can go through this whole list. You can see there's actually quite a few of these and it's a growing list. You'll see this thing with zero output technology. This is a unique feature. What this means is when the battery's full and you're in float, rather than turning the regulator off, which some people do, we will manage the battery current to be zero amps. It leaves the alternator, the alternator active, so if you've got an air conditioner pulling 2,000 watts, we'll supply that power for the air conditioner from the alternator, but make sure the battery doesn't get any more energy put into it. That's what's been coined zero output technology. Contrast to some competitive solutions, because they can't manage current. When the battery's full, they'll just turn the alternator off. So you're drawing 2,000 watts out of your battery and discharging your battery, cycling it up and down. That's what zero output technology means. You can choose whether you want to deliver that value or not. Okay? Uh, and then last one we got, enable. Any questions so far? 
I know, this is a whole lot. We started real simple, it took 30 seconds, and now we're in the deep end. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I noticed on like some of the, the rose colored profiles, like I wouldn't see a number and then I would click on it and then it would automatically keep a number there. Is yeah. that kind of just the default setting? Of usually it is, yeah. That'd usually be the default. Uh, what you want to do anytime you're entering any of these rose color areas is have that 100 page document there. You'll have to find what specific command it is. Uh, they're broken out, like if it's a tachometer thing, it's probably on the set configured tachometer. If it's a system or a battery, you'll have to find out where it is. But you'll know, kind of understand what that command's doing, you know, what that parameter is doing, and you can read the description. It's usually a um, you know, paragraph or two, or sometimes half a page, depending on how, how in-depth it is. Okay. Yes, sir? So is there a different manual for different versions, or, I mean, should that be the same, uh, all those different setups, um, are they described the same way or should you update the manual when you do an update the version? When we release a version of firmware, the question was is there a correlation between the firmware and the manuals? When we release firmware, we release a manual with it and in the, an update to this document and in there, the very beginning of it, I'll talk about what's changed, what we've added. It's really rare that we depreciate stuff, that we take things out, really rare. We try to main backward, maintain backwards compatibility. So the new stuff will be added in the manual. We'll try to update the app to coincide in the same way so they're all kind of in lockstep. Now, I'll give you an example of something we took out. That ability to lock out, where you can prevent from people from making changes unless you issue a reset command with the uh, password, we actually had another level that you could not reset the regulator. And some computer science guy thought, oh, our customers want that option. They thought it was a great idea, so they put it in. I'm not going to say who it was, but uh, in the real world, our customers were saying, we never use that, and sometimes we pick it by accident. What do we do? Because now we have a brick. And the answer was, you had to send it back to the factory to be reset. So our customers said, interesting idea, you pinhead of no value, take it out. So we took it out. Used to be you had two levels of lockout, now you only have one. And when we made that change, we made in the firmware that if a regulator was locked out at the higher level, it would be bumped down to the resettable one. We just removed that whole feature. It's very rare that we take features out. The very next one that's on the chopping block is this pullback. We're probably going to take it out of the app because the white space is a better way to do it. We'll probably leave it in the regulator in case somebody's in the field and already using it. Okay. And if you want to know what pullback factor is, go and read the document. And when your eyes are glazed over, because mine get glazed over with it, you'll realize why, yeah, white space is a better way to do it. Any other questions? Okay. Yes, sir. We've got a customer we're considering the white speed. And uh, it's a world cruiser. Yes. Would you recommend buying a secondary weight speed or a spare? Yes. And um, this is what my recommendation is. They should buy a secondary weight speed regulator. You as the installer should configure it for them. You should, you should make sure they have an Android tablet. And both the secondary weight speed and the Android should go in the lightning box with the e handheld EPIRB and the VHF. As a world cruiser, the single issue we have, failure modes in the field, is lightning strike. You never know what's going to die or live or die. We have one installer that always installed two regulators uh, online. They had two alternators, two regulators. You don't need to do that. If you have two alternators of the same size and capacity, one regulator is going to drive it. All those Nordhavens, that was done. Two large 280 amp alternators stacked right on top of each other. Uh, one regulator driving it, and we actually use this feature because it was CAN connected. We use this with two temperature sensors. We had one installer that would always sell a second regulator and install two regulators. And I've gone round and round with him because his statement was his redundancy is unreliability. You know, it's redundancy. Well, lightning strikes would be your most likely issue. You're going to take both of them out. Have your spare in the, in the uh, box. I will also tell you, our um, 
pseudo-military customers carry a spare. It's inside the EMP box for exactly the same reason. Well, not exactly the same reason, but instead of lightning, if <laughs> something else takes out all the electronics on the vehicle, it's right there next to the engine spare, engine computer and stuff. So yeah, my answer is, as a world cruiser, you absolutely should carry. You should also make sure you've got an Android tablet with them in some way. Make sure they got the cables, make sure they have the configuration files, and pre-configure it for them. Okay? All right. <clears throat> now the moment you've all been waiting for, the engine tab. The easy way. Hook up your CAN bus to the engine, single engine, J1939, twin engines, you're going to have to go through NEMA, and define that, that tab. So go ahead and go on your app, swizzle over to the engine tab, and say, yes, I wish to define max engine load, and type in 60. 60, my experience, that's actually not a bad number. You'll have to adjust, obviously, to match the situation, but guess what? With that right there alone, you've delivered the value of, you can do the hydraulic pump, you can do the low speed and maneuvering, you can do the power over the hump, you can make sure you don't overload the engine at the high end, you can make sure your really expensive sprinter, sprinter van with a teeny little turbo diesel engine is actually able to start up the hill. All that stuff you can do with this one parameter. That is, I think, the best way, but, you got to give the regular data with the can. If you can't do that, then we'll do the second best way. We'll go ahead and say, do you want to use white space? And here you have a choice. The next choice is, do you want it always enabled? Or do you want to make it so that it's only enabled when the, when the uh, feature in wire is used? So if you want it to be always enabled, turn that thing on, if you toggle it on, if you want it to be only when the feature in wire is active and white space will be overlaid, you can do that. This is useful in that scenario like where you've got a hydraulic pump that's also on that engine and a way to signal to the regulator that it needs to reduce stuff back. Of course, another way you might address that is you might choose to have the feature in wire select uh, half power mode. And the, declare a percentage value of like 40% for the alternator at half power mode. There is a couple of subtleties here. You'll notice that when you selected the options for the feature in wire, it did not present an option that said, do you want this to control white space? You'll notice on here, it says, do you want white space to always be enabled or only when feature inactive is, the feature in is active? White space is an overlay. All the rest of the stuff that the regular normally does, this is an overlay. You can set the feature in wire to select half power mode with that feature in wire. And if you toggle this, it will also control whether white space is enabled or not. It's not, it's an overlay, it's an addition. Same thing with these sliders. When we get down to that point, that's an overlay. So if, let's go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and go back to your app. And you'll enter the maximum engine RPMs and let's say 3,600. And remember, you gotta get RPMs into this regulator somehow. Hopefully you can figure that out, okay? Now, here are those little sliders. And just so you don't accidentally press them, you actually have to click this little box over here to enable the sliders. So now you can slide the sliders up and down. And what this means, like here, I'm showing 10% for the lowest RPM. This doesn't mean that the regulators only drive the alternator at 10%. What it means is it's only going to let the alternator produce 10% of what it thinks it should do. It's an overlay. This is a kind of a struggly concept, but there's reasons for it. So if the regulator has decided, because of all the input, that it should drive the alternator to 90%. We'll only let it go to 10% of that. We'll only let it drive to nine, okay? It's an overlay. And all the other parameters that the regulator uses to decide what it should do, the white space 
gets applied as kind of a layer right in between it to modify that decision before it actually gets out to the alternator. So kind of a hard concept to get around and we struggled with what, what to do. We settled with this, there's some good reasons for it, there's some really niche cases that make sense for it. Yes, ma'am. I think I have a general understanding of why you would adjust that, but would you give us an example of why you might want to adjust, for example, um, the initial, like, from zero RPMs yep. to up to 50%? We're going to do that right now. So what we're going to do, this all came about when I first learned about this. Some guy in Sweden, he had a little one-lunger, nine horsepower engine for his auxiliary to get in and out. And he put like a 190 amp alternator on it. He couldn't move. He said he put it in gear and he advanced the throttle and the engine's RPMs wouldn't come up. It was just so overloaded at that. So we're gonna make a curve for him. You know what? He doesn't have a problem at the high end, but at the low end he does. So we're just going to play with this. And maybe at the very low end, we're only going to let 10% be. And then as RPMs come up, and that's between 450 and 900, we'll let the regular do 25%. And then as you get higher up, we'll let it do 100%. You know, we'll keep moving up. We'll shape it. So what we've got is an engine that can't produce enough power at the low end. So we're going to restrict the alternator out, output at the low end. And that's what your curve would look like. It, does this show well, or do I need to use the air tablet? Can you guys kind of? OK. Now, let's take another example. Let's say we have one of these go-fast boats. One of these go-fast boats, and you hear them, they got the lopy engines. And when they put the throttle in gear, the boat lump jumps forward because it's got so much low-end torque. You know what? He doesn't need any help at the low end. So we're just going to leave those all the way up. However, this is a go-fast boat. And the guy who designed this made it so when you're at max RPM, so when you firewall at the throttle, you're putting all that horsepower into the prop. The prop curve, load curve, has matched the engine output curve. So at the high end, we're going to back off, whoop, we're going to back off the alternator. We're going to do like, I don't know, 5%. And then maybe just a little bit before that, we're going to do a little percentage like this. And what'll happen if we don't do that, because we've got these big alternators on here that are pulling 20, 30 horsepower out of it, we'll overload the engine and get black smoke out the back. So this is your massive go-fast boat. Now, let's take an example of somewhere in between. We've got a boat with kind of a modest engine. You know, it maybe needs a little, it struggles a little bit at the low end. So maybe we'll just limit it at the low end, 40%. And at the high end, we got kind of the same condition because the output and the alternator loading matches. So we'll leave the high end the same, but this guy's struggling to get on step. And we have figured out that this boat tries to get on step right around 1200 RPMs. So I'm going to take that slider that's got 1200 RPMs and I'm going to pull it back. So that's going to reduce the alternator load on that engine while we're trying to get the boat up on step. There's three examples for you. Now, when you got a boat like mine that I can only put 42 horsepower in and I've got a big uh, torquey inline six Cummins engine, that's what my curve's gonna look like. Actually, I'm not even gonna turn on white space because I don't worry about it, right? So this is what lets you fine tune the loading if you can't gain access to engine. Does that answer your question? I think we are done with how to configure the wake speed regulator. Before I move on and before I go over here and look at my slide deck to make sure, are there any questions about using the wake speed app to create a configuration for sending that configuration down to the regulator? You'll notice these things are grayed out that's because I'm not connected to a regulator. They are not enabled. When you plug it in and it works, those things will become available to you to select. The sharing we talked about, the importing, when you share a configuration, oh, here's a little hint. 
When you share a configuration with someone, you're going to get two files. You're going to get a text file and a JSON, a JSON file. The text files would actually get squirted into the regulator. The JSON file is what you want the customer to import. And the reason why is that JSON file has all the rich details such as the brand, the name, how many batteries there are, what brand they are, whereas the text file only has the raw stuff the regular needs to know about. Yes, ma'am. So if you do what we talked about before, which is have your customer get a feeder Android phone and they want to share the mm -hmm. file, yeah. how do they do that if they don't have a cell phone plan? Is it possible? Yeah, uh, you just hook it up to Wi-Fi. Okay. They can't download it, though? Well, I guess, what if they don't have Wi-Fi and they're using their other phone to text you? Well, then they turn their other phone into a hotspot. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not here to solve your IT issues. <laughs> I retired from the computer industry. I hate computers. <laughs> okay? You call Elon Musk and order one of those fancy satellite things. And, uh, all right. All right. Um, we added this thing. It's kind of hidden here. It says confirm device. Uh, you can press it if you want to. If the regular says it sent it down, it sent it down because every time it sends a line down, you get an actual confirmation back from the regulator. But we added that because people say, well, how do I know if the regulator is confirmed? I will tell you there's a bug in the current release of the app and it's being fixed to the next one. The current release of the app is very literal. So if we have a parameter that says 2.500 and we get back 2.50, that confirm will say, those don't match. So we told the regular that trailing zeros really don't matter, or the app that trailing zeros don't matter. In the next release, 1.7, that'll get addressed. Okay. Um, we've talked about these slide out features and we demonstrated them all. You saw how you use them to configure the regular, to do the device settings, to do the system settings. Uh, we didn't really do too much on the uh, updating of the device in terms of specifically the firmware update, but you can play with that on your desktop. You can just update the firmware. I'll tell you in normal mode, you will always get the latest firmware. It will go out and pull the regulator and ask what the firmware that's in the regulator is, and it'll compare versions. If you need to update it, it'll tell you you should update it. If you're in expert mode, you can do that, or you have the ability to sideload in different firmware versions. You may get a really gnarly situation where you have somebody send you a trial version of firmware or where you for some reason choose to do a down rev version of firmware. You've contacted our support and they've sent you a DFU file. That's the file that has the firmware. Going into expert mode is what lets you select that DFU file and send it into the regulator. Otherwise, you're only going to get the latest version. Um, hints, I guarantee you we've covered all of these things back in the room. We use uh, the monitor tab for the initial checkout. You guys saw how we did that. We used the monitor tab to verify in the static mode that the regular was able to see battery voltage and current. You could also see that there were no temperature sensors hooked up. So probably those are important, so hook those up. If you have a CAN connected, you can see it. You can see the color shift. This is all static without the engine running. Just plug in the USB cord because remember, in addition to communicating, that USB will power the logic side. So it's a way to test out all the all the stuff of the regulator. Right? We talked about the logging screen. We talked about the system screen. Uh, we talked about expert mode unlocks uh, different features on all of these screens. My recommendation is that uh, my recommendation is that you spend 20 seconds and look at that stuff. Do a quick test before you turn on the key switch. Just give it a stiff test, make sure it works. <clears throat> Do you guys, how many of you are video game guys? Do you understand what cookie means? In video games, and first off, I'm not a gamer. I just don't have the patience for it. But I am told what a cookie means is sometimes developers will hide something. A little special feature. Ooh, you can get an extra powerful big gun. Or 
a rose, I don't know what it is, but you get something that's beneficial if you like do a certain thing. In the wake speed application, when you're on the configuration screen, the edit screen, on the bottom there, there's that save or next. If you press and hold that, a little window will pop up and all those raw ASCII commands will come out in real time. And if you are the person who has read, yes, I'm looking at you, if you are the person who has read that manual and you want to see the ASCII commands in real time and you don't want to be bothered to go over to the monitor tab and have the app parse that and put it in dials and gauges, but you want to see the real stuff, that's how you can see it. And if you're a guy like me, because I've been doing it forever, I'll often go and use that because it's like, oh, I can see what's going on. The nice thing about it is it gives you a little trend. It's the same data you're going to see in the log files, and you can see like a mini trend because I think we display like about 20 lines. So you can kind of see a trend that's going on, on in that way. We are going to go through these slides really, really fast uh, because we've talked about a lot of this stuff. But what we're going to talk about next is things that we have learned, how to do the bring ups and things that are lessons. So some of these I'm going to slow down on because I think they're really important. Other ones we're just going to bypass. The first one is system. You may have noticed over these past two days, I've used the word system more than once. That wasn't by mistake. These are high energy. I hate the word complex because complex is scary. But they are involved systems. You have to design them. You have to make sure every piece works with each other. Back in the day when you just threw a 120 amp alternator on and a couple of golf cart batteries, didn't matter. Very forgiving. Today, if you don't do it right, $20,000 and a burning refrigerator. When you think of this stuff, you cannot think about, here's my wake speed regular. You have to think of the wake speed regular as a part of the system. The batteries, the alternator, the regular, the engine, the BMS, the solar panel controllers, the AC, you know, the AC, all that stuff you have to design. That's why this class that you're taking doesn't happen in a week. That's why it takes months. These are complex systems. And you are going to be dependent upon to design and deliver reliable systems. The wake speed, I'm hoping you're learning, is a very capable tool to allow you to accomplish that. Engine loading, I think we've talked about this four or five times. Uh, high reliability, we talked about this a little bit, things you can do uh, as you're designing your systems when you want to go that step beyond. Go through and, re and review in the expert mode your required sensors. If the alternator temperature is important, make the alternator temperature sensor a required sensor. And know that if it doesn't exist, the default behavior is we'll go into half power mode. You can learn that in the Bible. Look at all the required sensors, check off the ones that are reasonable that you think are important, and look at the behavior and decide if your default behavior is good or if you want to have it to toss a fault. I will tell you my personal opinion, if you design a reliable system, you should never have a failure in this stuff. I tend to toss faults. I want that service call. You may not want the service call, so you can take the default behavior. Another reason you may not want the service call is this is, though, is, this is a passage maker. And if they're halfway between here and uh, you know, the English coast, it's okay if the regular runs in half power mode. We'll get there, right? We'll accept the default behavior. So think about that. Another, oh, and one specific problem area on this is the required sensor for the current shunt. It's hard for us to know where you actually have a current shunt there. So what we actually do is we look for current value indicated, I think five amps is our trigger, plus or minus. We want to see an indication of current going through that shunt sometime at the startup of the regulator. And if we don't see it, we'll toss an error. It's all documented in the, in, in, in the Bible. But that one's a tough one. Hope, a lot of these stalls, and especially the more advanced ones, you're not going to use a current shunt anywhere. If you do, you go put it on the alternator. It's not going to really matter whether it's there or not. Right? 
but just know that particular one is problematic. Um, BMS aggregation. This is a very unique feature of the wake speed regulator. Do you remember one of the very first examples I told you about the uh, vessel that went uh, voyage and did the passage to Hawaii? It had two, BMS, two battery systems in the bow and the lazarette, and the one in the bow went offline. Wake speed regular was aggregating those BMSs, and when they were both there, it behaved in a way appropriate for both of them. When one went away, it dynamically adjusted. There's a small number of batteries that we can do that with. Today, that would be lithionics, that would be MG Energy, and others I can't tell you about. Those guys can do BMS aggregation. It's a good value. I will guarantee you Dragonfly Intelligence will be able to do BMS aggregation. It's a good value. Um, get home mode. This is another interesting advanced high reliability feature. And we it's kind of a two-edged sword. Um, because when you put these advanced features in, and then operators are running, and these things enable, and they don't understand what happened, they're going to say, what's wrong? Why is this thing not working? We have get home mode defined for the Victron Lynx BMS. You could do other BMSs as well. And here's what the deal is. If we depend on a CAN-connected BMS to get our information, the question is, what do you want to have happen if that BMS goes away, if we lose that connection? Now, you could make it a required sensor, and you could have the regular fault out. Or you could have, uh, I forget what our option it is, but you could have it go into a, actually, I think what it does is it goes into float mode, is the default behavior because I think that's how we do with the Victron links. Now, in that case, you still want to make sure that the regulator is not going to exhibit a uncontrolled disconnect, so that's why we also connect up the white wire on the Victron links. So in normal operation, we communicate via the CAN. In get home mode, what we do is we realize we've lost that CAN connection, we go into a fixed voltage mode, and we've actually picked the target voltage of around 40% state of charge for lithium batteries, roughly, because we're a voltage only regulator, right? And we depend on this wire to tell us it's okay to charge. Now, if we lose the CAN connection and we lose this double fault, then we obviously shut things down. But what this lets you do when you're halfway across the Pacific, if for some reason the CAN bus went sideways, it lets you get home. You won't get home with fully charged batteries, but you won't be calling CETO and trying to convince them to make a 12-day journey to get you, you know, somewhere uh, east of the Azores, right? So that's another advanced feature you can do. Um, these are some of the, I'm sure there's a lot of other creative things you can do with a wake speed regulator. It's a tool and uh, who knows, maybe you'll come up with some other ideas, but these are some of the things that we, we have already figured out. Uh, we're now going to enter this phase of the real world, things that we've observed. Actually, I'm going to stop right now. Do you have any questions up to this point? Because we're really starting to wrap up a bit here. Any questions popping in your head at this point? These are now some of the real world experiences that we have found that are problems with the wake speed. And we've talked about a few of them. It's a very configurable product. People configure it wrong. People go into expert mode and reconfigure it. You know, it's, most of them are configuration. I think 60% of the calls to get to me are configuration. 40% of the calls to get to me, they haven't hooked all the bloody wires up, you know, RTFM. Hook up all the wires, the required wires, please. But these are other things. So customer education. A lot of customers, and they're smart people. I mean, I'm not saying people are dumb. They're, just, they're smart people, but they're not expert. They're not, this isn't their area of space. So they're used to how voltage regulators work. They look at how the behavior of a system with a wake speed in it behaves, and they don't understand it. They don't understand that we're not putting out voltage, we're not putting out power, because the BMS has asked for us to stop charging the battery. They don't understand that their 
80 amp alternator is only putting out 40 amps because the alternator is getting too hot. We do all this data and we do all this assessment to decide how to drive the system and people just don't understand it. They just say, look, it's not working. That's probably one of the bigger things that you're going to have to do. Spend some time talking with your customer. Tell them that this is an advanced system, it's highly engineered, it's highly reliable, and it's going to behave in certain ways that may not be intuitive to you at, one, at original. Now, it could be that something's gone wrong. It could be that something's wrong or broken, or it could be that you found a bug, or it could be that it's configured differently. I'm not saying all cases are customer education, but there's a lot of them that are. VRM is probably your best friend. Because what you can do when you have a customer say, I don't understand what's going on, log in the VRM, see what's going on with the system, look to see where the battery is at, look to see where our charging sources do, look to see what the wake speed is doing, and try to ascertain what's happening in the system, and try to educate the customer. Okay? Um, both of these examples I've already given you. These are real life examples of customers who said, this product's defective, I need a new one. And we've covered both of these, right? The first one is because the batteries are out of balance and the battery said stop charging, and guess what? We kept you from bringing your boat down. The second one is the alternator had really horrid cooling to it, and guess what? We kept you from bringing up your alternator. But in every single case, it didn't meet the customer's expectation of how a voltage-only regulator would have behaved. And that's why it resulted in a service call. Bring up and check out. We're going to burn through these quick because we all did it back in that back room. Um, I will say, this is another one of my favorite slides, don't be this guy. Don't install the regulator and say, oh, it's all good, bye. And I'll also tell you, and I really don't understand why this is, I cannot tell you a number of times we've gotten calls. Oh, I need help bringing this regulator up. Yeah. We've been working on this boat for two months and the customer is leaving for Bermuda on Friday. <laughs> it's like, they've regular, I don't know why, the alternator regular is always the last thing that gets looked at. But don't be this guy that just says, hey, it looks good to me. Do instead, first run tools, uh, simple assessments, LED patterns. Look at the pattern, what is the LED doing? What, what is this blinking pattern? You can see the definitions in the guide. And as you can tell, don't memorize them, look them up, because even I get them wrong. Look at the other instruments that are in there. Does it match? Does it seem reasonable? Look at the uh, displays. Use your ears. Did you hear the engine loading up? Use voltmeters. Use clamp on amp meters. There's a ton of stuff you can do with just simple tools without getting uh, really over the top. If you then go into the level using the wake speed app, that's your next tier. You will use like we did, the monitor page, the log page. You can ask customers to take logs, have them email it to you. These are all tools available to you. My suggestion is start simple. Look at the LED, look at the volts, put a meter on the blue field wire, see if you're getting field dry. If you don't, just start real simple and then move up the food chain, okay? <clears throat> Two-step approach. This is exactly what we did back there. Engine off, we connected up the app, we went to the monitor tab, we made sure that we were getting uh, the voltages measured and the current measured, and we found out that we had the system wired wrong. So we adjusted the system wiring. We moved the load onto the side of the shunt so the shunt could see all of the load, not just the charging aspect. All right. Next step is you want to turn it on. Again, let it warm up, use the monitor tab, watch stuff rise, you should see voltage and current rise, you should see the alternator temperature come up. That's your next step. Um, it's also during this engine, this engine off time, this is a great time if you've got things like a Victron servo, it's a great time to check to make sure that the wake speed's communicating with it. If you have a NEMA 2000 display, great time to make sure it's communicating. Remember, when you plug in, to this USB port, you power the logic side. You don't have to turn the engine on, you power the logic side. It's a great way to check out all the logic aspects of the regulator and unplug the USB before starting the engine. We don't want to shock load it, okay? 
Uh, the expected behavior is like we saw there. It starts out so slowly blinking, starts ramping up. You'll hear the engine loading. You'll see voltage come up. You'll also see if you've got a, uh, a slave mode. We've talked about all this stuff. I'm just re kind of summarizing it. You'll see that color shift. That's something you definitely want to be seeing. Um, hint, start out with a battery that's at like 60 or 70% state of charge. Give it something to do. Uh, if you want to start out with a full battery like we had back there, just know it's going to quickly go into float mode because the battery's full, right? <clears throat> uh, listen and watch. You don't need anything more than your eyes and your ears and a couple of gauges. You should hear the engine loading. You should hear, see delivery of energy on your monitors. Really, that's a lot of what you, what you really need, need to look at. You can do this all with or without the wake speed app, right? <clears throat> When you, some problems, there's no LED. Check the brown, check the, check the power wires, is it installed? Most of the time it's because people have, these are the two critical wires. It doesn't take much to get this regulator to blink. You can make it blink by USB power or the brown wire with the, uh, the black and the yellow stripe wire are the two critical ones. Remember, the stripe wires are the ones that go to the logic side of the regulator. So this is the logic ground wire. So you need the brown wire for power, you need this for ground. That's all you need to make this thing power. We've had customers call in, it doesn't work, they haven't hooked up all the wires. So that's the thing you wanna do. Uh, if you're getting red LED, there's gonna be two causes for it. The first cause is that the regulator is in fault mode. And that is because, I'm gonna force this regulator to go into fault mode. By the way, I will tell you, because I know you're all tired, if you go to the wake speed website and you go to the learn tab, you will see videos on how to do all this stuff. Okay, so that weight regulator is uh, starting up, is doing its blinking green. After about 30 seconds, you're going to find it goes into a fault. And the fault is that it can't see battery voltage. And the pattern you're going to see are two bursts of quick blinks and then it's going to blink out the fault number. It's a two digit number. Don't count the bursts. When we get a support call that says I have a fault 44, it's like you are definitely an overachiever because you're counting bursts. Don't count the bursts. I'm not that cruel of a person. So it hasn't quite made it there, but it'll get there eventually. What's that? It just did the bursts. Oh, did it? Oh, okay. So now we're getting a pair of 14. If you look up in the documentation, you'll find fault 14 says no battery voltage has been sensed. So that's an example of a fault, okay? <clears throat> the other time that you'll get red blinking, and that's a very distinctive pattern. The other time you'll get red blinking is if one of those required sensors are not present and the regulator is running in a degraded mode. You'll get the normal blinking pattern, but it'll be red. So if the temperature sensor is missing on the alternator, we're running in half power mode, you'll see the normal pattern, but it'll be blinking in red. That's the second time you'll see the regular um, blinking in, in, in red for color. First one problem, first run problems, the alternator. Um, <clears throat> By and large, this may seem like a cheeky answer, no output from the ultimator. Should there be? You'd be surprised how time, many times we get subvert calls that says, I'm getting no output from the alternator. Well, the answer is there shouldn't be because you're in New England with lithium batteries and it's minus 20 out and you can't charge batteries. Or <clears throat> the BMS is asking for no charge. There may be a legitimate reason why there's no output from the alternator. You can sometimes tell that with a blinking pattern, or you can look on the wake speed app, or if you have a servo, the servo will actually tell you that monitor tab that we had. It'll tell you what mode the regulator is in. It'll tell you what the field drive percentage is. If you find the field drive percentage is zero, either through the servo, VRM, or the wake speed app, then the wake speed has been told it shouldn't be driving the alternator. Now, on the other hand, if you find that there's a number there is trying to drive at 30 or 40%, we have another issue. But surprisingly, this comes back to customer education. This 
This right here is surprisingly a fairly significant number of calls. No oils are in the output. Um, field, alternate arrow K, we actually talked up quite a bit about this. You can use a voltmeter on the wake speed and you can watch as the percentage drive goes up, you should see the field voltage go up in a controlled way. Um, I will tell you that you have to have something connected to the field wire. Just the characteristics of our electronics. If you have just an empty wire like this, you'll get random information. You can put a resistor or a light bulb if you have an old school you know, light bulb. Just put some sort of load on here and you should see the voltage coming up. And there should be a direct correlation between what that field drive percentage is and the voltage you see in a controlled way. It's a great way for first checkout. Um, you can clamp an amp meter like we did in there on the output of the alternator, put a voltmeter on the battery and or put a voltmeter on the field wire. And as we go from the lazy warm up into the ramp phase, you'll see that stuff come up in a controlled way. Um, expect to see uh, uh, engine off. Measure the field ohms. We did this yesterday. We also tried talking about that uh, screw, the magnet pull on the pulley. Uh, if you want to do a full field, you can do this while the engine's running. Disconnect the wake speed. Uh, sometimes the first, you know, the first thing is do a divide and conquer. Disconnect the wake speed from the uh, alternator itself. Take the field wire off the alternator and briefly touch it to full field. See that magnetic pull, or if the engine's running, you can, uh, you can hear the engine load up because you're basically stomping your foot on the alternator gas. These are techniques you can use. Be very careful. Um, you know, be safe here, okay? Any questions on this? Comments, Rick? Got that? Spinning rust guy? <laughs> no, you've, you've done a great job. Okay. All right. Uh, first run. Uh, Alternator is only putting out a few amps. These are problems we heard, first one problems. I'm only getting a few amps out. Well, is the battery full? Look at the LED, are we in float mode? Are we in slave mode and is the BMS asking for a small number of amps, right? Uh, alternator overheating. These are some, another reason why we get low output from the alternator. Alternator damage, that actually is a reason and typically when the diodes go bad, They'll usually all go bad, but I have seen them where like only part of them go bad. So you get maybe 20 amps out of the alternator in, in it just because part of it's working and not the whole thing. So there are some esoteric ways. That's where you can do that full field test or pull the alternator and take it to a competent shop and have it tested. Yeah, if you do a full field test and that alternator comes up really slowly, then, then you know it's an alternator problem. It just needs to be fixed. Yeah. Our experience, alternators are tough. It's pretty rare they're bad. When they are bad, the most reason, common reason is the diodes have gone out, and so usually a result of low quality diodes and or extreme overheating on the alternator. Um, you can, that magnet screwdriver test won't tell you that. That full field test will. You should hear the engine load up. I mean, literally, you just put it on for two seconds and you should hear the engine struggle if the alternator diodes are good. If they're bad, you won't hear it struggling. So, but in general, alternators are pretty tough. They do have diode packs go out though, and that's ways to test it. Um, oh, this is an interesting aspect. Alternator output unstable. The most common reason we see that is because the alternator gets hot. You remember I told you how we do regulation, active regulation at alternator temperature? If the, reg if the wake speed is not able to actually regulate it, if it's too extreme, we go to the next step where like everyone else does large pullbacks. And you'll see that in the behavior. You'll see like a five or a 10 second period where the alternator does really hard output and then it'll output will go way low and go real hot and way low. This is where the log file helps. Look at the log file. You can see the alternator temperature. You can see it reaching its limit and going over its limit. You can see the field drive being cut way back. That log file will tell you over time what's happening. That's how you can know what's going on. The solution to that is derate those percentages, that normal percentage or the half power, that 100% or the 90%, cut that back to a smaller number. 
because what it's saying is that alternator is not capable in that install of being driven that hard. So give the wake speed a little bit of help. When we're under temperature, don't let us put the gas all the way to the floor. Let us just kind of manage the gas a bit. So that's, if you see that kind of temperature cycling, improve your cooling on your alternator and or reduce the D, the, uh, D rate factors is the way to solve that. Uh, can issues, the other place I've seen <coughs> with instability is with the zero output technology or if anytime we're actively regulating current. And it's usually be from getting battery current via the can. We're trying to do process control over the can and sometimes we get instability. If that's happening, you'll see cycling going on and again the log file will tell you because you'll see a target value for the amps but you'll see the amps going significantly over it and then get cut back. It's just, we're just not getting enough responsiveness. The answer for that is uh, to hook up the gray and purple wires and let the wake speed regulator sense the battery current information directly. When it comes over the can, best case, we get that information twice a second. When we sense it directly, we're getting it hundreds of times a second. So you can kind of see, see the difference in the challenge. There's something also called a uh, slow ramp. This is kind of a real obscure feature. When we are very far away from a goal, we'll ramp the alternator up quick. And as we get close to it, we'll kind of sneak up on the goal. We call that fast ramp. Sometimes in some environments, the system overshoots and you get instability on voltage or current. A way you can try is to enable slow ramp. And the way you do that, it's subtlety, is uh, in the app you'll toggle a toggle, but with the, uh, if you're doing it manually, you use a negative number on the engine warm-up delay. And what that will do is have the regular just always come up slow. When we were back in the marine world, we had slow ramp. We added fast ramp because we had guys in RVs driving in the city, going stoplight to stoplight, and going one block wasn't enough time to ramp the alternator up. They weren't getting any output, so they wanted a fast ramp. But that's another really obscure, we don't, I can only think of one vessel where they've had to actually do that. And I'm not really sure it was a real problem, but uh, it's a very, very intelligent guy we, I've worked with for a very, very long time. And he said, yeah, that fixed my problem. So I said, cool. Um, common issues, incomplete install, you know, only connected a few wires, testing it out, overthinking the configuration, going into expert mode. When I get customers, I step way back. I have a belief start simple and get success and work from success. If you want to add all these advanced features, great. Let's have a very simple configuration first and make it work. And then we can start layering in the advanced features. Very often people will just dive into the deep end first and uh, create issues. So um, that's overthinking the stuff. Uh, the 15 amp fuse, you'd be amazing how many calls we used to get because that 15 amp fuse on the red wire wasn't installed. So many, in fact, that actually the version two of the regular, if it doesn't see a voltage on that, 15, on that red wire, it'll throw a fault. But if you got a version one, we don't sense that. And that's a good reason why the wake speed ink would drive the alternator, no power. Uh, or they reverse the 15 amp and the three amp fuse. They put the fuses in, but they reversed them. And the moment they started driving the alternator, that three amp fuse opened because it just wasn't up to it. Um, we've talked about issues common issues with alternators. I think the biggest issue I've ever seen is this conversion, converting of alternators. I've, we've talked about this quite a few times. It can be done well, but it can oftentimes not be done well. Some alternators are good for it. There's a lot of them. It's, it's not that they're bad alternators, it's just they weren't designed for this heavy power generation to recharge house batteries. They were designed to put a little bit of power in the starter battery and care and run your radio and your fans. So that's another common area we've found issues. Um, you know anything else on the alternators, Rick? Okay. <clears throat> um, on some very specific installs, the number one issue we have with Lynx BMS is that white wire. If you look at the wiring details from Victron, there's a ton of jumpers and a ton of things and you have to get it exactly right. I will also tell you, there are Victron diagrams out there that are wrong. Some of their first diagrams were wrong because I've had Victron dealers send me the diagram and it doesn't match what's on the website. So they have a down version. Go to the website, 
get the latest drawing. Victron on the Lynx BMS has got two or three drawings on how to wire up the wake speed. There's one on the back of the wall right there. That white wire is the single big, biggest issue. A very quick test is because what happens is the regulator won't go anywhere without that wire being enabled. It's held in standby mode. A very quick test is just temporarily connect this white wire to you know, positive battery voltage. If things start working, then you know this is the issue. And it's usually the little jumpers on the Victron. You also need to know on the Victron links, you have to go in and declare that we're talking to an alternator. There's some auxiliary circuits that you have to declare that's being used with an alternator. That's part of the setup of the links. So we'll make sure you do that. Um, RJ45 jacks, different pinouts. Boy, have we talked about that in the fun. So go to the Wake Speed website, the Learn tab. There's a Victron install user's guide. It talks about the pinouts and how to make a crossover cable. Buy one of our crossover cables if it works. Make your own. It doesn't matter, but that's a very common issue. Not very common, but it's probably the most common issue that we have when people are doing uh, MG Energy or REC BMS. REC also, by the way, their default cables will be Victron. You have to get a wake speed variant or you have to somehow do a crossover. Okay, CAN issues, we've talked about this. Terminators, 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 probably the biggest thing. Um, I think the second biggest thing is that they just haven't hooked up the wires or they crimp things wrong or, or they've gotten over complicated in, in their system, they've gone from one style of backbone to another. Keep it simple, right? Uh, Lithionics, uh, <clears throat> a very specific detail. You remember how I told you we can do BMS aggregation? With the Lithionics batteries, you have to manually configure each battery with the new instance. They won't automatically do it. So if you install two batteries, you have to go to that second battery and there's instructions from Lithionics to use their app to configure that battery to say it's the second battery. If you don't do it, the wake speed is going to think there's one battery. And by the way, all the lithium gauges are going to think there's one battery. So if you've got two 320 amp hour batteries, the lithium is going to say, hey, you have a 320 amp hour system. That's your first clue. When we're delivering energy out, if the alternator is producing uh, 200 amps, but that little lithium gauge says 100, because 100 is going to each battery, that's your clue. Everyone thinks there's only one battery. So you have to reconfigure the lithium battery, specifically be a second battery, and the third and the fourth, okay? Um, over time, <clears throat> yeah, this is a great one. The service switch. We have had alternator fail. Uh, we, we've talked a little bit about load dumps and the dangers associated with it, right? You get that massive voltage spike and the avalanche diodes will suppress that. Well, what will happen over time is the avalanche diodes will eventually say I've had enough. They're good for about two to three iron hits, something like that. We had one, <clears throat> I had a call from one uh, installer. They said the person brought their van in because their alternator was smoking. And actually while it was in, they said, oh Lord, the thing just got on fire. Horrible thing, you never want to hear it. Here's what had been done. There, they had installed the system correctly. We recognize, what they had happened is, the operator had read on a forum somewhere that if you're using your van to drive and get groceries and Slurpees, turn your battery off. Disconnect your lithium battery, don't stress it. You know, it's not bad advice, maybe that's not a bad idea. There's no reason to charge and discharge when you're just getting the Slurpee, right? The problem was, the way the system was configured, is they turned the battery off, but it didn't turn the alternator off. So every time they started the van, the wake speed woke up, there was sufficient residual magnetism in the alternator to have it self-start. It would start ramping up, there was no load, because the battery is disconnected. It would go up, hit the avalanche diodes, wake speed would do a load dump uh, trigger, and we would shut everything down. Everything was safe. It happened every time they started the van. And after two or 300 times of starting the van, the alternator gave up the ghost. They aren't meant for that. The solution is, don't open that service disconnect switch. Hide it somewhere. Another thing you can do, <coughs> and I know this is very common in the marine industry, you can get those service switches with auxiliary contacts. 
little smaller ones. Route the brown wire. Where's my brown wire? Route the brown wire through that service disconnect switch so that when the battery is disconnected, the regular will also be depowered. That's actually a good solution for that approach as well. But these are the dangers of these newer systems that have to be thought through. Hadn't been thought through, what happens if the customer does that? Um, yeah, I don't know what XXX is. That must mean I ran out of time. Danger to the zones. All right. I guarantee you we're getting to the end here. This is just kind of revamping things. More hat than saddle. Um, other charge sources not configured correctly. You know, just because the wake speed is backing off, it might not be the wake speed issue. You may have solar panel chargers that are overstressing the battery and, and doing initiating a disconnect. <clears throat> Alternators without surge suppression. I'll make a little comment. This technology does not exist for 48 volts. The, the whole transportation industry hasn't solved this issue for 48 volts yet. As a matter of fact, for 12 and 24 volts, the ISO standards say Avalanche does is the best protection. For 48 volts, there is a standard. It simply says, thou shall never have more than 68 volts, I think is what they say. You have to design your system to prevent overvoltage, which is what we do with our uh, batteries that we have, um, have a, a good integration with. So just as you, it's not important now, but as you move forward, just know that's not a thing today. Some people are working on it, but it's not a thing today. Um, existing alternators, we talked about, be leery of battery uh, systems not designed as a system, people just buying components off the shelf and throwing it together. Battery switches, uh, web form and experts. Yay. Load dumps, I was waiting to find this because this is one of my favorite topics. Everyone down in Reno hates the phrase load dump because this is my favorite topic. Who in here knows what a load dump is? Oh, I am disappointed because the guys in the back either aren't listening or they, I'm disappointed. A load dump is defined as an event where an alternator is active and the battery is disconnected. It was discovered right there. That is the definition of a load dump, right? It was discovered back in the day when we went from generators to alternators. And mostly it came about because of uh, corroded battery cables. You'd go over a railroad track and you'd get a little bit of disconnect and the alternator is active and we don't have the uh, battery to absorb that energy and you get this voltage spike. The engineering reason why is because alternators have a high inductive component. It's called an inductive kick. It's actually how spark plugs work when you get that 50,000 volts to spark a spark plug, that's an inductive kick. With the alternators, when we see a load dump, that alternator is producing energy and all of a sudden doesn't have any place for it to go. Inductors don't like that. Inductors will rise voltage to try to keep that amperage the same. That's a physical property of inductors. As that voltage rises, the wake speed regulator will detect it and very, very quickly, almost immediately, turn off the field drive. However, the damage is already done. There are joules of energy contained inside that alternator because it's a giant inductor and you're going to get a giant voltage spike. So much so that the auto industry realized this was a problem. So they documented it. We love the auto industry. There are millions and millions of dollars poured into this stuff that we can take advantage of. I love it. For a 12 volt system, this is the test curve of a load dump. This comes out of the ISO spec. For a 12 volt system, you expect to see a 100 volt spike. For a 24 volt system, you expect to see a 200 volt spike. Could anybody guess what happens on a vessel when you apply 200 volts to your 24 volt system? I have told you two or three times what happened in one case. $20,000 of damage, and the refrigerator caught on fire. There were two problems with that install. 
Number one, the batteries were not proofed. They did an uncontrolled disconnect. They weren't ones that we had looked at. It was an unfortunate choice. An uncontrolled disconnect happened, and the alternator they were using did not have avalanche doubts. If either of those two conditions hadn't existed, we wouldn't have seen this. But they existed. So we had $20,000 worth of damage and the refrigerator on fire. And I keep harping on that. I don't want to be scary about this. We remember, we've done tens of thousands of these. We usually see about once a year somebody with tears. It's some event. And, you know, that is an extreme case. The more common case is the electronics gives up the ghost or, you know, maybe they had to replace their AM radio or something like that. It is not a joke. System, system, system. Design your system. This is why guys in Reno hate hearing me harp on this. This is the single number one killer and single number one risk we have in these high energy systems. We want to prevent this from happening. We want to have batteries and alternator regulators as a system, which we have tested on our wake speed labs and are listed on our app. If it's on here, we feel confident this is going to be safe. Install it like we tell you to do it, and you're going to have a good starting point. If it ain't on here, it may be fine. I just don't know. I just don't know. The other thing that the auto industry did when they first discovered this is they said, well, this is unfortunate. Guy drives over a railroad tracks and we get this 100 volt spike. Well, I guess all you guys out there are going to have to figure out how to deal with it. And the guy who made the radio said, oh, wait a minute. It's going to cost us 34 cents to deal with this 100 volt spike. We're going to have to put your protective devices in there. And the problem is, is I make radio for GM. They're not going to pay me 34 cents. So I can't do that. Auto manufacturers are cheap. They won't even pay 34 cents. And more so, the real problem, more, there were more problems. You can't protect light bulbs. You put 100 volts to a 12 volt bulb, guess what's going to happen? So having the individual components survive that 100 volt spike was not really viable. So what the auto industry said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a best practice. We're going to have a best practice of suppression. And we feel the best place to do suppression is in the alternator with avalanche doubts. So this ISO spec, oh no, darn. This ISO spec has actually a second curve that clips here. And for a 24 volt system, I'm sorry, for a 12 volt system, that's usually around 20 to 32 volts. I think the spec is actually 35 volts or something like that. What it means that as I, as a designer, when I'm designing something to go in a, a transportation environment, I only have to design my stuff to survive 35 volts. I don't have to design it to survive 100 volts. There are physics and costs it's actually not hard to design for that. 42 volts is a magic number. It's pretty easy to design for that, okay? Uh, and that is the best practice, and that is why I keep harping on avalanche diodes, because way back in the 60s, really smart people said, this is a problem, this is the best way to solve it. Right. Have I said enough on this topic? And how do you know if your alternator has avalanche diodes? You ask the alternator manufacturer and you hope you trust them. Um, I will tell you that the partners we work with, if you go and see where to buy, we're pretty confident they have them. There are external suppression devices. Um, of them all, I personally like the Balmer one, the APD, the best. I don't think it's a replacement for avalanche diodes, but if you want to do belts and suspenders, that would be a way to do it. Yes, sir. So if you're in the app, in your app, mm -hmm. you're in the alternator section, and the alternator you select is on your A party list, is it fair to conclude it has uh, met that bar? <clears throat> I will tell you that we have very good conversations with a number of alternator manufacturers. I can pick up the phone 
and I can talk to the engineering team at Nation's Alternator. I can pick up the phone and I can talk to the engineering team at American Power Systems. I can pick the phone and believe it or not, I can talk to the engineering team at Presto Light. So yes, they all do. You want to guess what happens when I pick up the phone and try to talk to the people at Balmar? So, I don't know. My, I have heard that most of them do, but I've also heard that not, not all do. And that's one of the reasons they came out with the APD. My answer is go and ask the alternator manufacturer. I personally have a high level of confidence that the, the, the big manufacturers, the Leastonvilles, the Presto Lights, the, uh, you know, the, uh, Decos, not Decos, the, uh, if it's not least, if it's not Presto Light, it's. Uh, yeah, Presto Light, Leastonville, um, uh, most of the, uh, well, like uh, DC engineering they're going to have. Yeah. So anyway, I mean, most of, most of the big guys do. I also know for a fact there's ones who don't. And I think we talked about this yesterday. The reason why people don't put avalanche diodes in is they cost more and they're less efficient. You may have heard through the grapevine of a fairly high dollar value um, vessel that had an issue, large number of batteries. Turns out that didn't have avalanche diodes in it. And that was an unfortunate case. And the thing is, when we went back and talked to the installer, they said, yeah, I know, because the manufacturer used to put them in and got too many service calls. Well, gee, do we know why you get service calls on avalanche diodes? Okay, so the answer is APS, Lee Snowville, Nations, yeah, I'll guarantee you they do. Uh, Balmar, which we think are great alternators, I believe most of them do, but I think there's one or two who don't. That, uh, that verification in your lab is not really your I don't look at alternators. Your job, yeah. yeah, I don't look at the alternators, yeah. And, and by the way, the alternator I have on my test bench does not have avalanche diodes. It's a 48 volt, 200 amp alternator. That's my primary test al bench alternator. I actually use that to test this because I'll drive and force a disconnect. And I want to see, I, I do this at the very end. I do a lot of testing ahead of time. But the final one is, and the first time I did this, oh my Lord, this guy grabbed the fire extinguisher, literally. He said, don't do that. And I did it anyway because I wanted to prove that the behavior of the system would shut down safely. That's the type of stuff we do so that you guys don't have to. That's how it makes that, okay. But good question. All right, um, test sw switches. We talked about this here and you've got an example of one over there, right? Is this the one with the AUGS contacts or not? Okay, perfect. So you can get these. This is actually an AB switch, a rather complex one. But if you look on the back, You'll see there's the heavy power terminals. And then you see these little ones here. These are the field disconnect. You'll see them called field disconnect. These were actually pretty common even back in the day with lead acid batteries. You, a lot of times you'd run your power wire through that oil pressure switch, then through this guy. And you know, that way when somebody turned the ultimate, you know, when you had the batteries turned off for some reason, you wouldn't burn stuff up. So um, we think this is a, a, a really good idea to do. We think a good idea to do is, is hide that thing away. Don't make it readily available. We think a good thing to do is put a little sticker on it that says for service only. Do not turn this switch off while the van is running or your hair will fall out. You'll grow fat. Your girlfriend will cheat on you and your dog will bite you. We think having all that kind of stuff, none of that is excessive. Okay, because, well, we want systems that are going to survive despite how creative uh, the operating public is. Uh, alternators, more hat than saddle. Boy, have we covered this a lot, right? Heavy duty, very aware, converted alternators, careful of something with no surge suppression, high voltage diodes. You wanna know the worst offenders in this space? And, and I'm gonna say again, when I make these comments, I want you to understand, these are not bad products. They're just products that are not appropriate for this use. Okay, there are a class of alternators that are largely sold to the stereo guys. 
And what they'll do is they'll have a little small frame alternator that can advertise at 320 amps. Well, in that usage model where you're just doing a couple of minutes to try to pull that much energy out, they may work very well. Those guys will overheat very quickly if you try to run them for 20, 30 minutes. I'll guarantee those guys do not have avalanche diodes yet. So for that application, they probably work well. They are not a good choice for these high energy systems because they are more hat than saddle in that case and they don't have the protection. So unproven batteries. Um, we have a list and we have engineering the engineering conversations to get on that list, especially with the lithium batteries. And we have examples of those batteries where I can put it on my bench with my giant alternator and Rick doesn't live near me anymore. So my wife comes out with the fire extinguisher when I do this now, right? So, you know, I, again, there is a lot of batteries and there's a growing number of lithium batteries out there. Um, whether they're drop-in batteries, which by the way, we do have one drop-in battery that we support and it is Battleborn. We used to have two, they stopped talking to me. So, and they actually stopped talking to me before the acquisition. So we actually were leaning toward taking them off. But we have engineered a system with Battleborn to feel safe for 12 and 24 volt deployments, not 48 volt. But for 12 and 24 volts, we believe the approach is appropriate. And part of that is myself having an engineer, engineer conversation, who in this case happened to turn out to be our CEO, who knew how these batteries worked, and we could define when the batteries would disconnect to make sure we were safe. But just because a battery is uh, listed as you can use it for anything, or just because a battery has a connection or a CAN connection or a wiggle wire, it doesn't mean it's going to do what we need. And specifically, that whole disconnect is the most important area that we have to focus on because of reasons that we've already covered with the load dump. Uh, Be careful about customers who bring batteries in. The, it always happens. Customers buy batteries and just say, make a system that works with this. You all can decide whether you want to be involved in that or not. Um, deploy proven sign, service disconnect, auxil connector, warning label. You can make one like I said or not or something a little bit more palatable, but. You know, lots of that type of stuff. <clears throat> that is the end of this presentation. Great. Thank, Thank you very much. You.